Malik. Professor Malik is a chemical engineer turned molecular biologist. He is currently the professor and associate director of the Basic Sciences Division of Fred Hutch. He is also serving as an early career scientist of the Howard Cooks Medical Institute and an affiliate professor of genome sciences at the University of Washington. The specific focus of his lab is on genetic conflicts that takes place between different genomes or between components of the same genome. His team takes an evolution guided functional virology approach to delve deeper into the field of paleovirology and genetic conflicts, having direct implications in conditions such as HIV and cancer. It's truly an honor to invite our accomplished awardee, Professor Harmit Malik, to deliver his Shastra Obed Siddiqui Award Lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I hope you can see my screen, okay? Yes, sir, perfect. Um, as I mentioned earlier uh, during the award ceremony, I am deeply indebted to get this award. I'm completely honored and floored and completely humbled um, by any association with Professor Beit Siddiqui, who is very well known in the genetics community for having uh, harnessed and harbored this culture of creativity in Indian science and, and in Drosophila science that still persists uh, to this day. He's an uh, inspiration to many of us. Today, I'm honored to give the uh, Obed Siddiqui Award Lecture, and my lecture is going to be focused on genetic conflicts from viruses to chromosomes. The work in my lab is actually focused on genetic conflicts, which has its roots in a very unusual source, which is the fictional character, the Red Queen, who was introduced to us in the book Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, where Alice goes to Wonderland and starts complaining that they've been walking for a very long time and not really getting anywhere. And the Red Queen replies that in Wonderland, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. This was actually seized upon as a very important synthesizing idea that uh, allowed evolutionary biologists like Lee Van Valen and his peers to formulate the Red Queen hypothesis. And they argued that for an organism to be successful or a species to be successful, it just was not sufficient for it to adapt to its local abiotic environment let's say temperature or moisture conditions, it also needed to adapt to the other species that were competing for the same fitness space in that environment. So for example, it was not just sufficient for the snow leopards to deal well with the cold, but they also needed to deal with the adaptive escape strategies of the snow hares and uh, vice versa. So in, in a sense, the fitness of the leopard population was intricately tied to the fitness of the uh, snow hare population. And this became a very important theorem and, and is still a very important theorem in ecological evolution. What labs like mine try to do is take a molecular approach to take this ecology-based idea and apply it molecular terms to look for conflicts like what we see between leopards and um, hare populations uh, and uh, attribute those kinds of conflicts to what occurs between host antiviral proteins and host and viral proteins that are trying to infect the host and reduce its fitness. We refer to these as extrinsic conflicts because they are occurring between two different genetic entities. But today I'll also touch upon some work in my lab where we have conflicts that can take place even between components of the same genome. And these conflicts can have dramatic consequences on human health as well. So to first talk about just um, this conflict between hosts and viruses, you can see that in this cartoon example, the host protein, which is an antiviral protein, is recognizing some feature of the incoming virus. And by doing so, is now going to recognize the virus and mediate its antiviral action. In response, the virus is going to evolve very rapidly away from this interaction and therefore rescue itself from this host antiviral effect. This means that the virus is temporarily winning this particular arms race, putting pressure back on the host population to now reestablish uh, the antagonism of the virus. The number of arrows here indicate that the viruses have a huge advantage as we are all discovering on a planetary scale, viruses can evolve very rapidly 
and they actually have access to much higher population sizes than host genes do. But nonetheless, host genes have some tricks up their sleeve, and we'd like to uncover what these tricks are. You can see that in this system, either the virus or the host is winning. And because of that, there's always going to be an evolutionary advantage to be gained by genetic innovation. And my lab is interested in genetic innovation that occurs in many forms, but especially the genetic innovation that occurs in protein coding genes. So here's a hypothetical code um, uh, encoding three different codons, each encoding a different amino acid. You can see that mutations can occur in one codon that leave the encoded amino acid unchanged. We refer to these as silent or synonymous changes because um, despite the mutation, the final protein product has not been altered whereas other mutations will instantly alter the amino acid being encoded. We call these non-synonymous or replacement changes because they very quickly change the protein product of this particular gene. We make the simplifying assumption, which we can actually test, that the silent or synonymous changes are essentially hidden from natural selection, whereas these are instantly visible and acted upon by natural selection. Now, in general, most of these amino acid replacing changes are deleterious for function. So selection can actually act to purge the population of these presumed deleterious mutations. As a result, the number of apparent uh, replacement changes is far less than what we see for synonymous changes. In other words, we use high evolutionary conservation of amino acid residues as a rough proxy for functional importance. And this is completely a valid approach. But we also sometimes make the mistaken assumption that just because something is not very conserved in evolution, perhaps it is not very important. In fact, my entire lab is focused on categories of genes or even amino acid residues in which the apparent rate of amino acid change is actually higher than what you'd expect, almost breaking the mutational speed limit. And that occurs because selection is acting positively because these amino acid changes when they occurred were actually beneficial in the population, just like what we would see in a host virus interaction. And it is this high um, relentless innovation that we see in these genes that is of interest to us and as a unique signature of genetic conflicts. So what's nice about this approach is we can actually take this approach and apply it to all of the protein coding genes in the genome. So here's a comparison of us with our closest relatives in evolutionary terms. And you can see that the vast majority of genes lie in the left-hand side of the histogram because they're very slow to evolve at the amino acid level. But even with this very crude metric of a whole gene average DNDS, we can see that there are some genes that are evolving very, very rapidly breaking the speed limit that is imposed in a way by uh, mutation. And not surprisingly, immunity genes are heavily overrepresented in this category because they are actually keeping pace with a completely changing pantheon of pathogens. So what we uh, realized was that if we could actually narrow down where positive selection was occurring or where this very rapid evolution at the amino acid level was occurring, we do not expect it to be randomly distributed over the surfaces of these proteins. We actually expect it to be concentrated on those residues that maximally affect the binding affinity between these interactions. So what I'd like to tell you about is tell you about one vignette where we use this evolution guided approach to understand the biochemistry and the virology of these interactions. So for this, I'm gonna introduce this protein that I'm gonna talk about today called MXA, which is an interferon induced dynamin like GTPase. GTPase is probably the easiest thing to explain to a biology audience that it is actually a GTP hydrolysis enzyme, which is actually derived from dynamin, which is very important in endocytosis except MXA is dedicated for antiviral function and is turned on upon interferon defense. So interferon is your body's way of telling you you're under some virus attack, but you don't know what the nature of the virus is. So you're gonna turn on a number of different defense genes, hoping that one of them will intercede and block the virus in its tracks. MXA can be very, very important in defenses because mice that are deleted for MXA are extremely susceptible to infection by a bird influenza, whereas mice that have an intact MXA gene are completely protected against influenza in spite of the fact that the rest of the interferon system has been ablated in these mice. So here's a gene which can single-handedly protect you long enough for the adaptive immune system to take over and defend against this otherwise lethal influenza infection. So you can imagine that for the past 30 years, we've actually spent a lot of time trying to understand what is it that makes MXA tick? 
So the way MXA works is that the, these proteins, which are the PB1, PB2, and PA, are the components of the viral polymerase. And this RNA is actually wrapped around, and then the nucleoprotein wraps around the virus. Actually, the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, polymerase complex looks remarkably similar to influenza. This is the influenza version. And so what MXA does is it actually binds to the nucleoprotein and prevents the virus from undergoing its RNA replication and transcription. And that's how you're able to block the virus infection in its tracks. Today, I'm going to talk about two different orthomyxoviruses, primarily talk about Togoda virus, which is the model virus we use in the lab because it is not very infectious in humans, so it's e easy and safe to use, uh, versus influenza virus that we have to be a little bit more careful about because it is capable of infecting humans. So it started off with the premise that despite us knowing about MXA for nearly 30 years, we have no idea or had no idea how MXA was able to interact with the viral nucleoprotein. And so this was the first question that we wanted to answer and we decided to take this evolution guided approach to do so. So Patrick Mitchell, who was then a graduate student in my lab, decided to sequence the MXA gene from not just humans, but also many different primate relatives to understand how has evolution shaped MXA um, on an amino acid by amino acid basis. And he was actually helped in this project by our collaborator, Corina Patsina at the University of Freiburg. And what Patrick found was that despite the fact that MXA is mostly very well conserved in evolution, there are 12 amino acid positions in which the MXA changes very, very rapidly so that no two primates have exactly the same set of amino acid residues at these 12 positions. And you can see on this crystal structure of MXA, these positions are not randomly distributed, but they're actually concentrated in these hotspots of positive selection, with the biggest hotspot being this unstructured loop called loop L4, where we see five of the 12 amino acid positions that are evolving under positive selection. So we made the hypothesis that this may actually represent one of those rapidly evolving surfaces that interfaces with the virus. And so to test that, um, Patrick basically decided to test this idea that loop L4 uh, is the, in, in fact, the interaction interface with a nuclear protein. So to do that, he basically tested human MXA against Togoda virus. Human MXA was already previously shown to be remarkably effective against the Togoda virus. So in the absence of MXA, we have normalized to 100% infectivity. In the presence of human MXA, you can see infectivity goes down a lot. But for African green monkey MXA, which is the wild type version, we don't see any difference in infectivity at all, which means humans and African green monkey differ dramatically in terms of their specificity against um, the Togoda virus. And yet by just simply bringing in the loop L4 from human into the African green monkey backbone, we can confer nearly all of the protection that the human MXA provides. And even more remarkably, just a single amino acid change at residue 561 within loop L4 is sufficient to basically convert a previously ineffective antiviral into a very potent antiviral, which means that we are able to use evolutionary strategies to first pinpoint the loop L4 as the hotspot for positive selection, and then identify single amino acid changes that can convert this host losing uh, this arms race to the host winning this arms race. And this is, of course, extremely important in the context of grafting more and more properties onto the existing human antiviral proteins. So what's really nice about this is this tells us about how evolution has shaped the uh, immune repertoire. It also actually tells us about susceptibility determinants between the host and the virus. So it's not the case that one particular species has a completely different immune system compared to another. But what is the case is that the specificity tuning of the immune proteins in different species can vary a lot, but they vary at, specifically at these residues at the binding interface with the uh, host and viral proteins. And we can graph these single amino acid residues just like what we did with MXA to confer onto the human protein the property of antiviral protection. What's really nice about this kind of paradigm is it actually applies quite broadly to a whole variety of different antiviral proteins. They all have the completely different enzymatic activities. They all work against completely different unrelated viruses, but they, all they all have in common is the fact that binding affinity seems to be the primary determinant of whether this viral infection is going to be successful or not. And we can easily change that or tweak this binding affinity by single amino acid residues that dictate the outcome of this binding interaction. 
So, so far I've told you how we've been able to use evolution to look backwards in evolution and basically understand by asking where positive selection occurs, what the interface is. I'd like to quickly tell you about what we are able to do with this by taking a prospective approach where we look forward in evolution with the same playbook that evolution has already given us to ask if we can actually use this information to design potent and specific designer antivirals. So once again, we go back to MXA and back to this uh, unstructured loop L4, where we saw all of this rapid evolution. Recall that we had actually uh, found that residue 561 is completely essential. Later work showed that it, it really needs to be either a phenylalanine, a tryptophan or a tyrosine. Those of you who are aficionados will recognize that these are hydrophobic aromatic residues, which are very critical to bind potentially a hydrophobic cleft in the viral protein. So what a subsequent uh, PhD student, Rosana kolor did, along with a rotation student, Emily Shea, was she decided, okay, I'm really happy about the fact that we have about nearly 30 primate MXA genes. However, that still represents a very small subset of the possible number of MXAs, even with all of the combinations of mutations that could occur in the unstructured loop L4. So she took this combinatorial mutagenesis approach where she allowed each of the other four positions in loop L4 to mutate randomly in whatever combination. And using PCR mutagenesis, she was able to basically devise variants of human MX that are only variable at these four positions on, on loop L4, and then tested them individually against Togoda wires. And what she found was that nearly 65% of the variants that she discovered were just as good as wild type human MXA. About 30% of the versions were actually worse than human MXA, even though we had only changed these rapidly evolving positions. But most excitingly for us, she found that there were nearly 24 versions that were actually better than wild type human MXA. What I haven't told you about so far is that the reason we chose wild type human MXA and Togoda virus is that white type human MXA is actually the very best natural antiviral protection that we have discovered against Togoda virus among many, many different um, mammals. And yet we are able to dramatically improve upon this best natural protection simply by taking this evolutionary trick and applying it in the lab using PCR metagenesis. So this is what that data looks like, again, when we've retested each of these variants one by one. So here's a catalytically dead version that we normalize as one. Here's wild type human MXA, which gives you nearly tenfold protection, which is actually very good. And you can see that the very best versions that we have here are nearly 10 to 20 times better than the best natural antiviral protection that we have against this potentially deadly virus. So what this is telling you is that by taking advantage not of the most conserved positions, but actually of the least conserved positions, we are quickly able to manipulate the specificity of binding of this particular virus and actually increase its antiviral range and potency. What's really nice about this is that these super restrictors that we call them are actually better than the wild type version. As we increase the amount of MXA, you can see that the amount of antiviral protection gets higher and higher. But these super restrictor versions that remember only exist in our lab right now are much better at all different dosages. So this is not a case where there's a sweet spot where we need to deploy them. They're actually better in every dosage that we've tested. And what's really very remarkable is that the reason that they work so much better is very simply because of their increased binding affinity. Again, in collaboration with our colleagues at University of Freiburg, in the course of viral infection, we can show that the wild type human MXA has a very nice ability to co-immunoprecipitate with the viral NP protein. However, these super restrictors are much better at binding. So what we have basically done is use this evolutionary playbook to identify randomly generated variants of MXA that are much better at binding the nuclear protein of Togoda virus and therefore are able to be much more potently antiviral against this particular virus. So just to sort of summarize what I've told you so far, we started with human MXA where we didn't know what the binding interface was. Then we showed that using this evolution guided approach that loop L4 is in fact the binding interface and a single residue in loop L4 is critical for Togoda virus. And it turns out the same residue is also critical for influenza virus. We then took a super restricted approach where we allowed the rest of the positions to mutate and we found super restrictor versions that were much more protective against Togoda virus. 
So the question is, are these also much more protective against influenza virus? So Rosanna basically tested all of the variants she generated against both Kagoda virus and influenza virus. And what she found was very interesting where as you got better and better against uh, Togoda virus on the x-axis, you actually got worse and worse against influenza virus on the y-axis. Now, these are related, but quite distantly related viruses. And that actually tells us that the wild type version of human MXA, which sits over here, is actually in this jack of all trades spot where it's actually simultaneously pretty good against both Togoda virus and influenza virus. We can get significantly better against Tagoda virus, but we do so by paying a penalty in terms of influenza restriction. So we're very interested in exploring what is the biochemical basis of this trade-off and can we subvert this biochemical basis to making all uh, winning versions of MXA. But nonetheless, this really highlights how much potential there is to take this evolutionary guided approach against existing antivirals and actually make versions that are much more potent against pathogenic viruses, including the uh, one virus that is on top of all of our heads and one of the reasons that I'm not giving this talk in person. So by using this evolutionary uh, approach, we're able to attribute not just adaptive potential, but also evolutionary flexibility in terms of gain of adaptation, which is one of the tricks that hosts have up their sleeve that allows them to keep pace with very rapidly changing pathogenic viruses. So far, I've actually only told you about this sort of applied version of evolutionary virology, but one of the cool things about being an evolutionary biologist it, this also tells you a lot about history. So we've basically taken the same kind of approach to actually attribute this history of viral fossils that have taken home in our genome, primarily retroviruses that have taken home in our genome, where the last episode of retrovirus invasion of the human genome, we estimate occurred between 200 to 600,000 years ago um, in evolutionary time. There are 100,000 different integrant versions of 31 different families of viruses that are resident in our genome. And quite a sobering thought is that these dead viruses actually make up 8% of the human genome, whereas all of the protein coding genes and RNA that make up a human cell and organism only make up about 5% of our genome. So we actually carry around with us more dead virus in our genome. And what we've learned from these viruses tells us not just about evolutionary history, but also about how our, our ancestors fought off these ancient viruses to actually protect us from these infections. So I'm gonna sort of switch gears to the intrinsic conflicts because I think that those are also very interesting. Um, and today I'm sort of going to tell you about why we think about these intrinsic conflicts in the first place. You've already seen this diagram where we look at fast evolving genes on the right-hand side. And it's not surprising that immunity genes are found here, but what is surprising is that there are a number of genes that have really no business belonging in the fast evolving class, including genes that are completely essential for reproduction, mitochondria function, as well as mitosis and meiosis, which are fundamental aspects of biological reproduction that you would not have predicted would be associated with fast evolution, but nonetheless are. So we'd like to understand why that is, because this tells us something that is not just present in mammals, but is also a unique feature in Drosophila, which means that the same categories of genes show up no matter what type of animal that you look at. And I just like to make a plug that Drosophila is our primary organism of choice, just like it was Professor Obeid Siddiqui's uh, primary organism of choice. And he made many, many fundamental insights that attribute towards all animal evolution using this humble organism uh, as his model. But we've also been uh, encouraged to actually seek many other models, including different species of yeast, tetrahymena, butterflies, C. elegans, and even more recently, mice, in order to look at each of these categories and why they're uh, essential genes that evolve under positive selection. So why is it? So one simple way to think about why these essential genes would be subject to rapid evolution is we've all grown up with a left-hand side view of what the cell is, which is this beautiful, Swiss watch-like interaction of many different intricate gears and interlocking parts. Whereas what the evolutionary approach is telling us is that at least some of these parts are actually evolving just like they would be part of a prey-predator interaction. And so we need to reconcile these two views of biology with each other because the truth sort of lies in between these approaches. And it was actually incidentally this problem that first drove me to seek a PhD in biology. And it's also the problem that I'm still working on today. So today I'm actually gonna to tell you about just one example so that I don't go over time, 
in which we have focused on these proteins called centromeric histones, which are completely essential components of the chromosome segregation apparatus by which a cell divides its chromosomes equally to its daughter cells upon cell division. Now, many of you have heard about histones because they package up all of the chromatin in eukaryotic genomes. And whereas core histones bulk, package the bulk of chromatin, the centromeric histones are actually histone H3 variants that are completely specialized for this function of cell division. What is also really cool is that whereas the rest of the histones are among the slowest evolving proteins in our genome, centromeric histones, despite being completely essential, are often as rapidly evolving as immunity proteins. And we'd like to know why that is. So here's just a simple video about a human cell undergoing cell division with this beautifully orchestrated process in which all the chromosomes condense, come together to the central plate, and then are divided equally. This process happens millions of times in your body every day. And it's really important that no mistakes are made because any mistakes are going to lead to cell inviability, but also even more deleteriously aneuploidy that can actually be the beginnings of tumorogenesis. So this is one of the reasons why a cancer biologist interested in evolution of these proteins is actually working at a cancer center. So just to again remind you, the centromeric regions are the pieces of DNA, these small knobs shown here, where the microtubules would attach and pull these chromosomes to the daughter cells. So what could be going wrong? Why are these particular uh, processes under rapid evolution? So we considered what are the different types of processes that occur during chromosome segregation? And the first process that comes to mind is mitosis. Mitosis is a process by which one a diploid mother cell will give rise to two daughter diploid cells. And from an evolutionary standpoint, this does not seem like the most interesting process because you basically ended up with the two genetic twins of each other because they're identical in every way since they were derived from replication and division. However, uh, this view was upended for me by a graduate student in my lab who pointed out that in addition to these chromosomes, we can often have these extra chromosomal plasmid-like elements that are inherited and are not equally inherited across chromosomes, and they can actually easily subvert the process of mitosis. So uh, this graduate student, Michelle Hayes, whose picture is shown here, uh, focused on an extra uh, chromosomal plasmid called the two micron plasmids, which are very well known um, among yeast biologists, which undergo this process of a cluster uh, replication and then segregation to ensure their own transmission, almost like selfish parasites, um, into next generation, which is why most budding yeasts actually have two micron plasmids, in spite of the fact that they impose a one to 3% fitness cost. So Michelle realized that actually not all Saccharomyces cerevisiae or budding yeast actually have two microns. She, was, she did a survey and found three strains out of 60 wild yeast strains that are completely lost two microns. And this could be the result of a stochastic loss. The two microns just happened to go extinct in these strains or because these were genetically protected against the selfish parasite. And indeed, she showed that it was the second mechanism of a genetic defense, because even when she reintroduced a marked two micron plasmid, here's a lab strain, which is actually remarkably good at harboring the two micron plasmid. And here are the three wild strains she found, which are really good at evicting the two micron plasmid. So you can see this dramatic difference. Moreover, when she made hybrids between these two strains, the protection was actually dominant, which means that these wild yeast strains have some genetic mechanism that protects them against being hijacked by the selfish parasite that takes advantage of mitosis. Um, through a lot of very clever genetics, she narrowed this down to a single amino acid residue um, in a protein in the SMC56 complex that is actually involved in chromosome segregation that directly contributes to plasmid instability, really highlighting that our genomes are constantly battling parasites. The parasite might be infectious like with viruses, or they might be actually parasites that are genetic in nature, just like the two micron plasmids that uh, budding yeast seem to be dealing with. So the upshot of this story was that mitosis, even though we initially thought it was a boring process, turns out to be far from boring and is in fact a hotbed of genetic conflict. But mitosis really looks boring when we compare it to meiosis. So for example, in male meiosis, we have a process in which we undergo one round of replication, but two rounds of division. As a result, the final products of meiosis are haploid and they're genetically distinct from each other, different combinations of mom's and dad's chromosomes. Now, ideally in plants and fungi and 
animals, all of these should go on to become pollen or spores or sperm. But that would be the case if biology was very uninteresting. In fact, biology has a lot of selfishness built into it so that a red chromosome can actually harbor a, a gene that specifically acts as a poison for the purple chromosome, preventing it from completely going through spermatogenesis. As, as a result, even though you started off with two types of chromosomes that could be transmitted to the next generation, actually only one type of chromosome gets transmitted, the one carrying the selfish gene, which provides an enormous selfish advantage, not just to the gene, but to all the rest of the chromosomes that are linked to this particular gene. Enormous disadvantage to the purple chromosome, as you can imagine, because it is now bearing the brunt of the attack of the uh, selfish gene, but also an enormous uh, disadvantage to the rest of the genome, all of the other chromosomes, which suddenly drop 50% of their fertility because of the selfish action of a single gene. So the rest of the genome is going to act to suppress the selfish effects of this gene to try to protect themselves and propagate. So here's a case where the toxin encoded gene, which is harbored by the genome, and the mechanisms to prevent the toxin from acting that is also harbored by the genome are now locked in the arms race that is primarily at the level of which genetic information gets transmitted to the next generation. This is basically cheating that has occurred after chromosome segregation is complete. You're simply de deciding between the uh, successful outcomes of each of these progeny. So Sarah Zanders, who's a former postdoc in the lab, discovered actually a completely brand new mechanism of this kind of cheating in budding yeast like Schizosaccharomyces uh, pombi. She discovered this in a relative called Schizosaccharomyces kombucha, which is the fungal comp component of kombucha tree, which is a very popular uh, beverage in many parts of the US. So she discovered that this uh, gene, which was already called WTF, um, uh, in particular WTF4, um, has this very curious property where in the normal circumstance, both alleles have a WTF4 gene, and there is completely no problem in meiosis, 100% spore viability, no evidence for meiotic drive. However, if you get rid of the gene in one of the alleles, then only 50% of the spores survive, and the ones that survive are all the ones that are carrying the WTF gene, which means not having WTF in the presence of a WTF gene is actually very detrimental. This could be because this gene is completely important for some spore essential function, or it could be because this gene is a meiotic drive gene. And indeed, when we get rid of both copies of WTF, we completely restore spore viability and meiotic drive. What that means is that genes like WTF4 have absolutely no social redeeming value to contribute to host fitness. They only exist because they're able to outcompete the competition when the uh, competition doesn't carry these alleles, which is a classic definition of a selfish gene, which was again, one of the things that really inspired me um, when I was actually transitioning from chemical engineering um, into biology. How does this work? Actually, it turns out that WTF4 has a beautiful mechanism where early in meiosis, it actually produces a toxin product that percolates all of the products of meiosis. But late in meiosis, after the spore wall has formed, it also produces an antidote protein. As a result, only genes that consist of this particular WTF4 gene are protected from the toxin that it itself provided in the pool. So the genetic strategy appears to be poison everybody, but protect yourself. And by doing so, you basically ensure that the only spores that can survive are the ones that are carrying the WTF4 gene to the next generation. This is a very specialized mechanism discovered by a, a wonderful postdoc in the lab. Um, but what I'd like to point out is that similar mechanisms with completely different uh, biological properties actually exist in practically every system that we've actually looked at from mammals to plants to Drosophila, where the segregation distortion system was the very first to be discovered. I'm gonna end by actually telling you about the type of uh, chromosome segregation that my lab actually is most interested in, which is genetic conflicts that actually occur during chromosome segregation, but not in male meiosis, but in female meiosis, which is a unique mechanism that occurs in both plants and animals, where once again, we end up with four haploid products that are genetically dissimilar from each other, but now we don't have to in invent an elaborate mechanism to kill you know, sperm or kill spores because only one of these products is actually destined to make it to the next generation by inclusion into the egg. The other three are going to be destroyed as polar bodies are basically evolutionary dead ends. 
So now the game is not about inventing a toxin mechanism to get rid of the competition, but the game is to ensure that you are the one that makes it to the next generation by winning whatever uh, race there is to get to this preferred position to make it to the next generation. So we imagined a long time ago when I was a postdoc that this race must be taking place during meiosis one, because during meiosis one is where the microtubules are attaching and determining what's the inside of the uh, egg versus the outside of the egg that sort of ultimately decides who becomes the winner. So for example, in this case, if the purple chromosome had a higher ability to attract microtubules, it would basically orient itself to the interior of the egg at a much higher than Mendelian frequency and therefore be passed on to the next generation at a much higher than Mendelian frequency, which becomes this beautiful genetic conflict that is actively taking advantage of the process of chromosome segregation in order to, for these selfish chromosomal elements called centromeric DNA to transmit to the next generation. So we basically proposed, uh, Steve Hanikoff, who was my postdoctoral advisor and I, we proposed this model in which the centromeric DNA acts as a selfish parasite, in spite for being essential for all manner of chromosome segregation, it is also acting selfishly to propagate itself over the competition during female meiosis, whereas centromeric proteins, including the centromeric histones that I was telling you about, actually act almost like the immune system to, selfish the, to curb the selfish uh, tendencies of these uh, selfish DNAs. So what we have is a curious property where we have a DNA component and a protein component of an essential process in the cell involved in chromosome segregation or cell division. Yet for this one step, which is female meiosis, these formerly collaborating entities now become competitors. So this is a really great idea. How do we test it? And what would basically explain the very rapid evolution of an essential protein such as centromeric histones? So to answer this question, we decided to take a page out of our uh, host virus handbook and said, well, we cannot actually wait another million years for the next amino acid mutation to evolve in flies. Flies can, uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with flies, but that's still a very long PhD thesis. So uh, two very cool researchers in my lab, Ida de la Cruz and Emily Colo decided they're going to reverse the evolution of this particular essential protein back to an ancestral evolutionary state hoping that this would basically now unleash some deleterious consequences, which will actually reveal what drove the rapid evolution in the first place. So if you think about this as an arms race, what we are basically doing is we are forcing one of the entities to take a step back in evolution, hoping that that'll actually tell us what were the deleterious consequences that actually occurred, but do it all in vivo. So this is sort of our uh, cascading project called reversing SID evolution. So to do this, we took advantage of the fact that Drosophila melanogaster, which is our model organism, has a number of very close relatives, including Drosophila simulans and Drosophila yacuba. And taking advantage of this ev short evolutionary distance, we can basically make versions of the SID protein or the centromeric histone protein, not just from melanogaster, but also from simulans, also from yacuba, but also this ancestor version, which is the ancestor of both Simulans and uh, um, Melanogaster, which really doesn't exist now, but it was the version that existed two and a half million years ago. So we've sort of resurrected, if you will, an ancestral state for this essential centromeric protein. And thanks to the power of CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which won the Nobel Prize last year, as you know, we can reintroduce this version back into the original SID locus. Remember, SID is completely essential. So every time we mess with SID, we run the risk that we're going to end up with either infertile or inviable flies. So we're basically changing this very slowly in the endogenous locus, bringing in either the original melanogaster version or the simulans version or this hypothetical ancestral version, which differs only from 11 amino acids from the melanogaster SID protein, whereas the simulans version differs from 21 amino acids. So this is, the, this is the project that we basically did, but we, it's worth asking what could go wrong when we have the wrong version of the SID introduced into these flies. You could imagine that mitosis would go wrong. We didn't think so because mitosis, you're always kind of going up against a genetic twin. We thought that meiosis could go wrong because after all, it was this selfish process in meiosis that gave rise to this cheating in the first place. Or we thought perhaps the uh, transmission of centromeres through either eggs or sperm could go wrong. So the best way to do the experiment is to actually do the experiment, of course. 
So we introduced these different versions of the SID genes, the either the melanogaster version or the Simulans version or the ancestral version back into the genome of the Drosophila melanogaster. And we simply started doing genetic crosses to suss out what might be going wrong with them. So our first experiment, of course, is to actually make this all of this genetic manipulation and make sure that, that everything is okay by crossing these males and female flies to each other. And these flies generate ample amounts of progeny, which tells us that we've not actually, through our genetic manipulation, um, made some sort of errors in this process that would basically affect that. We then cross heterozygous variants with each other. So now we basically got one good copy and one questionable copy in both parents, and we cross them to each other. Those of you who remember your genetics 101 will know that you'll end up with three versions here, one that actually has a homozygous for the melanogaster protein, one that is like the parent, produces both types of protein, and one that is a melanogaster fly that is entirely producing the wrong version of the SID protein, which we think has rapidly evolved for some sort of consequence. And to our surprise, we actually recovered all three types of progeny, even though the progeny we recovered here was about 30% lower than expected, which was a very important clue that I'll actually come back to. Nonetheless, it was a really good day in the lab because we were able to get adult flies with the wrong version now of this replacement SID that we had actually introduced. So we could take these flies we could take male flies that have entirely the wrong SID protein and cross them to female flies that actually had the right SID protein. And if there was something that went wrong during spermatogenesis or male meiosis, um, we would predict that these crosses would not be viable. But these crosses were perfectly viable. So then we reversed the parents and we said, what if we were to take the ancestor encoded female flies and cross them to males that have the right version of the melanic acid SID? And these flies were completely normal, which means that six years after our entire manipulation, we had convinced ourselves that there apparently was nothing wrong with the ancestral Simulans version when we put them into the melanogaster genome because these flies are fully fertile. Until we basically did the one cross, which we hadn't done so far, which was we crossed two parents, neither of which encoded the SID melanogaster protein. And when we did this cross, we recovered no progeny. So you can see that in a melanogaster, melanogaster cross, we get literally hundreds of progeny. This is the reason why people love doing Drosophila genetics because there's a lot of progeny that emerge. And yet, even though these are completely fertile uh, flies, when we cross them to each other, the ancestor versions or the Simulans versions were not able to generate any progeny, but we could completely res rescue these by introducing a transgene. So what this means is, that the ancestral version, even though it's only switched for 11 amino acid changes, even though we've only walked back two and a half million years in evolution, cannot support the viability of mel melanogaster embryos in the absence of the native protein, but putting the native protein back completely rescues these embryos. Which means at the end of our odyssey, we basically arrived at a situation where early embryonic mitosis is really the problem that occurs when we have the wrong version of the SID. And because of the awesome power of cell biology in Drosophila, I can show you some movies in which each of these dots actually represents a nucleus that's undergoing division during early embryogenesis. So if you pay attention to the left-hand side, you'll notice that as you go through, you basically have this beautiful cascading synchronous nuclear division right at the periphery of the Drosophila embryo with very few um, nuclei kind of leaving the periphery, which would be what we would uh, expect if there was a problem uh, during cell division. In contrast, here's a fly in which we now have the Melsim ancestor instead of the melanogaster um, protein. And if you pay attention to this fly as we go through, you'll notice nothing seems to be going wrong until one stage in development where you'll notice all of these nuclei begin to run away from the periphery they'll drop to the center and basically be destroyed because they had some error in chromosome segregation that prevented them from being used for the rest of the Drosophila body plan. As a result, if we looked at fixed embryos, we basically again see these red dots. Each of them represents a nucleus, this beautiful array. There are some red dots in the middle because we do see some nuclei fall off even in wild type embryos, but it's no, nowhere near as what we would see in these ancestral replacement embryos where we have gaping holes in what should be an ordered array. And that's because we had huge errors in chromosome segregation as a result of just having the wrong protein during early embryogenesis. 
So the melanogaster embryos, those of you used to looking at these embryos for good or for bad reasons, depending on how you like your fruit, um, they look beautiful. They have these beautiful denticles associated uh, and mouth parts associated with proper development. Whereas the ancestor homozygous embryos or the sim homozygous embryos don't develop past the stage of embryogenesis because they have not enough nuclei to make it to the next stage in development. So what that means is that we basically using this in vivo replacement approach really understood what started off as this kind of cool observation of rapid evolution of centromeric protein to now fully understand what actually drove it, what was the insidious genetic conflict that drove it and what the functional consequences of this conflict might be. I'll end with this sort of very interesting concept where because this is such a fundamental process and because this DNA protein interface is so rapidly evolving, what would happen if this process occurred in two related species and we now try to bring these two components together, we would predict that this would actually lead to gross hybrid inviability or sterility. And indeed, five out of the eight mapped uh, animal speciation genes are basically heterochromatin or centromere binding proteins that are very rapidly evolving. Two of them were actually described uh, by my lab for functional properties. So this is really cool because we basically started with what seemed like this esoteric conflict that might be taking place in chromosome segregation, but the offshoots of that conflict are potentially the answer to Darwin's mystery of mysteries which is why is it that when we cross two different species together, like a horse and a donkey, often the male progenies are sterile, like the mule. And we think that one of the reasons behind the sterility might be actually coming from this dark uh, matter of the genome, which is where the heterochromatin or the rapidly evolving parts of the genome, including the centromeres lie, and genetic conflicts that actually might be shaped by them. Um, so I've given you sort of some vignettes. This, these are some of the examples of pro projects going on in the lab between hosts and parasites, but also between components of the same genome. I'll just end with some closing remarks uh, because it's such an honor to be um, really honored with the Obeid Siddiqui Prize. There are so many things I can say which would almost take up an hour. Um, he, he had this amazing life um, in science um, and, and he has this amazing record. But the three things that I basically just highlight, which are really good lesson for people like me, but also for students who are potentially listening to this lecture, is he really emphasized how important it was that mentorship matters, how curiosity driven research matters and how basic sciences matters where we can identify applied problems that we are basically going, but basically I started with this very basic curiosity driven approach in virology and we have now a potentially really cool application that we can use to deploy new antivirals. So you never know where curiosity driven research can actually take you. I'll just give my own personal version of this, which is my journey started at IIT Bombay, thanks to this amazingly generous professor, KK Rao, who was generous to uh, students like me, who are not even his students, and believed in me even before I actually started believing in myself. Um, then to my PhD advisor, Tom Eichbush, who was very rigorous and disciplined and taught that for his students, and really taught that in order to be successful, you don't really need to be a jerk. It's good to actually have some work-life balance in order to do that. And my postdoctoral advisor, Steve Hanikoff, I've, you know, I've met a lot of amazing scientists. I've really never met somebody like Steve even now, who, who's, whose way was like going all in and basically saying, go propose this crazy hypothesis to the evolutionary biologist because I have your back, even if you're wrong. And treating trainees like colleagues and expecting them to believe in themselves as that they act the same way. I'll also point out that I'm not a virologist. I hope it was not a painfully obvious thing, but all of my journey in virology actually started with this amazing collaboration with my colleague, Michael Ammerman, and we decided we could combine his virology and my evolutionary biology into a grand synthesis. And this has been like an amazing experience for me. So really great to be in a place where you're surrounded by fantastic colleagues interested in your science. And the final thing I'll say is that kindness matters. Professor Obeid Siddiqui is a testament to how important this is, that science is not a zero-sum game. He was always interested in other people's research and giving ideas, and healthy competition is a good thing, but if your field is toxic and unwelcoming, eventually it will kill itself, and that's not to the benefit of you or anybody else. And finally, his biggest lesson to me is that your trainees will be your biggest scientific legacy, much more than anything that you can accomplish as a scientist will be what they will accomplish and what they remembered about yourself. Um, my final thank you is to my family. It was a very brave decision for my parents to take a 
perfectly acceptable chemical engineering degree, eminently employable, go on to do management or something else and decide to take a chance doing biology um, in a foreign land. And they were very supportive. Uh, although I don't think my mom was very happy all the time, but hopefully she's watching this and realized this is a really good decision. And everybody who's listening knows that science can be a very lonely road. So I'm very, very grateful uh, to my wife for putting up with me and supporting me all these years. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed your lecture and well fascinated with the science that you do to understand the host pathogen relationship at the molecular level. So we have a couple of questions in the YouTube chat link. So before I read, uh, I would also like to request the participants to post their questions in YouTube chat. So the very first question is from my colleague, uh, Dr. Chandra Mohan. Uh, he has given his comment. He says, thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, what would be the eventual consequence of these conflicts in host parasite genetic arms race, the pathogen cannot win unless the host survives. That's an excellent question. Um, so there are some pathogens that we know of, some viruses in particular like herpes viruses that have really co-evolved with us for over a hundred million years. And that's because they're dependent on us for their survival. But there are other pathogens, especially pathogens like you know, SARS-CoV-2, for example, that can jump into new species very readily. We have a very a growing pandemic among the deer population in the US, for example. So it is not always a given that the host needs to survive for the parasite to survive if the parasite can jump species. So this is something that we have to worry about. Only if you can constrain the lineage of the parasite to be collinear with the host that you need to worry about those kinds of amelioration effects. So what we notice is that um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, expertise uh, that has grown up on social media about virology thanks to this pandemic. And there's a lot of hopeful thinking about what will actually happen to SARS-CoV-2 as it becomes endemic and as we get most of the population of the world vaccinated. But the, but the fact of the matter is that we don't know and there's not a predictability in terms of how attenuated the virus will become before it's exacted even more of a toll because every new uh, step on the evolutionary ladder for the virus is a completely new arms race that we need to reset our immune system to. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yes, thank you. So he has one more question to you. Uh, the human genome, like most genomes, has a lot of genetic fossils of viruses. Does that mean that in the armed race, the host is most likely to win the conflicts? Uh, it's a little bit, it's a great, a great question. Certainly the viruses whose fossils we see in our genome, we won the conflict. That's the reason, which is why they're a really fantastic uh, playbook for us to learn how to you know, how, what we did in our past to overcome these viruses, including viruses like Ebola and Borna viruses that we really care about as pathogens today. However, it's an ascertainment bias because we exist. So we know about all the viruses that, you know, we defeated, but we have many relatives that probably don't exist because some virus actually drove them to extinction. So it's a little bit of, when we look backwards in evolution, it's always worth uh, re remembering that, we are looking at a very uh, small snapshot of the evolutionary record because there are many species that don't have uh, living descendants. Yeah, thank you so much. So one of my undergraduate student, Ms. Parvati, uh, she has a question for you. She says yes, that please. she was so fascinated to hear your talk and the science. Uh, and uh, the question is, she says, you have mentioned about the rapid evolution of a few amino acids in the entire protein, irrespective of the conserved domain. So her question is, what drives this rapid evolution? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Parvati. So for many of these uh, amino acids, we don't actually know. Um, but what we know for the few that we've handfully, you know, what we have experimentally tested is that what drives the rapid evolution in the context of host virus interactions is actually binding affinity. So for example, if a single amino acid change allows the antiviral protein to better recognize the virus, then that particular variant will outcompete all of the other variants in the population and it'll take over. 
Similarly, the viral variant that arises that can escape this attention from the host immune system will rapidly take over. And that's actually what has happened, for example, with the Delta variant of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, where it basically was able to escape a lot of the adaptive immunity that had come into place from our seasonal exposure to coronaviruses. So um, binding affinity seems to be the primary determinant of these interactions. Actually turns out that even for the centromere story that I told you, it's actually, again, the binding affinity of the DNA and the protein interaction that ultimately dictates the rapid evolution. So where we see the rapid evolution, it occurs in those residues that maximally affect the binding affinity of those proteins to the DNA. Yes. So uh, she has one more in continuation with that. She, she wants to know, can these changes are uh, disadvantages, uh, you know, has major disadvantage in being the protein and negatively influencing their function? So that's what she wants to know. That's a, that's a beautiful, uh, extremely intelligent question. I appreciate the question very much. So one of the things I think you hopefully have realized is that what I told you is the result of all of the versions of amino acid changes that were successful, right? And there were probably many other versions that were tried that were not successful. And we don't really have a good record of that because those were not you know, successfully passed on. So what we have been doing in the lab is actually taking the protein like MXA and now introducing mutations in every position by an approach called deep mutational scanning that was devised by my colleague, uh, Stan Fields and Doug Fowler. So what that does is it basically introduces all 20 amino acids in every position of MXA. So that's something that's much more than what nature can do, right? Because we, there's no way that we can have that many primate species. And then we can assess how many of these changes are intrinsically deleterious for function, how many of them are deleterious in the context of the virus, and how many of them are advantageous. And actually turns out, that for these rapidly evolving positions like loop L4, most of them are not that deleterious. So the flexibility built into the loop is a double-edged win for the host because it both provides the opportunity to evolve a new version, but it does so without really compromising the function of the protein. Uh, Professor, like uh, it's a question from my end because you have you had used different models for validating your thought process, Drosophila, yeast. Uh, so the codon usage, that might be a lot of difference in the codon usage. So do it plays a major role over here? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Every time we do a comparison of different species, we have to reset our expectation for DN and DS because like you pointed out, because the codon usage varies and what is a synonymous change in one species is not a synonymous change in another species because of the alteration of the genetic code. So we have to do this completely de novo every time we do a species, but it actually is not computationally very hard. It's very much like a counting exercise, except the computer does that very quickly, you know, millions and millions of times. But we do have to correct for the code on the usage. Otherwise, we'd make a lot of incorrect inferences, in including, for example, in our nuclear genome versus our mitochondrial genome, we actually have a slightly different thing. So if you're actually looking for DNDS of the mitochondrial genome, it's completely different profile than what we would see for the nuclear genome. Yes, uh, Professor, uh, I'm basically a bacterial genetician. So, uh, you know, uh, Professor uh, Bassler from Princeton University, she always says that we are more than 90% bacterial. So something similar to that, even I could hear during the course of your lecture, you said we have more of viral uh, genetic uh, elements throughout our system, right? So can you please throw some insight uh, on that particular part? So Yeah, actually, uh, the, you know, I mean, uh, Bonnie Bassler, as, as you know, has like really done a lot in terms of bacterial communication. And our discovery that there are literally trillions of different bacteria that live on us and in us is really revealing a number of genetic conflicts. So actually it turns out that the, the bacteria also have their own viruses, right? That bacteriophage that actually yeah. go through them. So the bacteria are fighting viruses, they're fighting each other for their ecological natures and they're fighting the host immune system. So it's a fascinating four-way interaction where we are even, uh, we meaning the field is e even thinking about devising novel bacteriophage therapy to treat gut diseases like colitis and Crohn's disease as a way to overcome what is actually going on. So it's almost like using the adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the bacteriophage are like our friends in this business, even though they're completely uh, viral and they are just as much of an enemy to the bacteria as HIV is for us. 
Yeah. So uh, there are no more questions. Uh, so. Well, I just want to thank uh, Sastra again. I want to thank the jury panel for uh, thinking me worthy for this. And I'm uh, deeply grateful for the opportunity and the honor. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Sir, now live. Thank you. Distinguished speaker of the day, Professor M. R. N. Murthy, colleagues, and student friends from Sastra University and other institutes. A very good afternoon to all. On behalf of the Sastra fraternity, it is a great privilege to welcome you all to the Sastra National Science Day Award lecture for the year 2022 by Professor M. R. N. Murthy. Curiosity keeps leading us down new paths, says a famous quote. It is a pleasure to introduce Professor M. R. N. Murthy, who is an exemplar of this quote. Anyone who has had a common cold knows, knows viruses as one of the emperors of the invisible enigmatic empire of microorganisms. But how do these viruses look like? What is the shape of these viruses? Are they cubic shape? Are they spherical? Or do they have diverse shapes? What proteins are these viruses made of? And how do they end up forming the shape of the virus? These are some of the intriguing questions that Professor Murthy pursued using X-ray crystallographic technique. For a long time, he was the only crystallographer working on viral proteins in India. In addition, his groundbreaking insights into the structure and function of key enzymes and proteins of several pathogens, such as Plasmodium falciparum, Salmonella typhimurium, have had a great impact in the understanding of the invisible empire of microorganisms. Professor Murthy is also an excellent teacher who has a knack of teaching difficult concepts in an interesting and insightful manner. He actively engages in science outreach programs, inspiring kids throughout the country. I have had the fortune of listening to Professor Murthy in a couple of instances, including the talk he gave to school students during the DST Inspire Camp at Shastra in 2015, which without doubt was awe inspiring. Sir, the infectious enthusiasm and curiosity that you radiate combined with excellence is something that we need to learn from you. Professor Mr. Murthy is currently associated with the Institute of Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology, Bengaluru, as a distinguished professor and AstraZeneca chair. He obtained his master's degree in physics from IIT Madras and then joined the organic chemistry department of the Indian Institute of Science for his doctoral studies under the guidance of Professor K. Venkatesan. Professor Murthy's doctoral work was concerned with conformation of peptides where he carried out molecular mechanics calculation on model peptides to understand their conformational properties. Thereafter, he joined Purdue University, USA as a postdoctoral fellow to work on structure determination of glyceraldehyde-3 phosphate dehydrogenase and catalase under Professor M.G. Rossman, a world-renowned crystallographer. He later joined as a faculty member at the Molecular Biophysics Unit at the Indian Institute of Science, where he served until his retirement during this, until his retirement. During this period, he was one of the key persons in developing crystallography in India. Professor M. R. N. Murthy is a recipient of a long list of awards and honors right from his early career. He received the highest honor of, for a scientist in India, the Shanti Swaru Padnagar Award in 1993. He was awarded the Rustam Choksi Award for Excellence in Science in 2002. He was also honored with the G. N. Ramachandran Commemoration Award in 2003, the Hari Om Ashram Trust Award in 2004, the Jagdish Chandra Bose Award for Life Sciences in 2005, and the AstraZeneca Distinguished Science Award for the Popularization of Science in 2005. Professor Murthy is a proud recipient of the 2022 Shatra G.N. Ramachandran Award for Physics for his stellar contributions in X-ray crystallography. With no further ado, 
I now hand it over to Professor Murthy to deliver the Shastra G. N. Ramachandran Award Lecture. Sir. Sir, uh, you may share the screen and... Yeah. Am I sharing now? No, not yet. Okay, maybe like this. Just, just a minute. No, do I share? It, it's coming up. Yeah, it's come. You can uh, you can put it in the full screen, maybe. Okay. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vignesh. And I also am very grateful to Sastra for this award, which means very special to me, as I have explained earlier. But I think there are many people now. I will, as we go along, I will tell you. You know, my title I have given for my talk is Excursion into the World of Structural Biology. It has been a long excursion of 40 years. So the excursion tale can go on for a long time, but I will only tell you some highlights of this journey. Why did I work on viruses? You know, it all starts from Raman. Raman had two brilliant students, Ramachandran and Ramasheshan. You know, both of them were very brilliant. You can see their faces. Ramachandran is very serious and reserved. You know, he was very academic and nothing else. Ramasheshan is smiling. They are both equally talented. And he was a dreamer. You know, he dreamed big. And Ramasheshan's student is uh, Venkateshan. And I am Venkateshan's student. So I am a great grandchild of Raman. And the other line, Ram, Ramachandran uh, uh, also has, uh, Ramakrishnan was working with Ramachandran and they worked out the famous Ramachandran diagram. And his student was my colleague. Uh, you know, it, this, then when I was in US, I was working on proteins in Professor Michael Rasman's laboratory. It just turns out that Rasman and uh, Ram, uh, Ramacheshan were working for some time together at Oxford. So they knew each other well. And as I said, Ramasheshan is a big dreamer. So he was, the, you know, he knew that protein crystallography has, is being established in several labs around the world. In India, there was no lab. But he thought it is best to start directly on some studies on viruses rather than proteins. So he wrote to Rasman to identify an Indian who can come to Bangalore and work on viruses. So Michael asked me to go to Bangalore and work on viruses. I told Michael, you know, I am a leg broken person and you are asking me to uh, uh, go, go up Mount Everest. You know, I, very scary. But he said, no, 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 it will always work out. You go and start. So I came to India with Ramasheshan's uh, uh, invitation to Indian Institute of Science. But when I came, of course, I, let me just tell you what one has to do and what facilities are needed to look at the structure of the virus. You have to isolate the virus from whatever plant uh, in, it is infected or animal cells. And then once you purify the virus, you have to crystallize the virus. And then you take the crystal to the X-ray lab and bombard it with X-rays. And the X-rays, uh, that, that will give you a uh, photograph which we call a diffraction pattern. But of course, you see, as you rotate the crystal, the picture will keep changing. So you have to hit the crystal from all directions because you want finally three-dimensional information. So you get a large number of such photographs. And each part in this photograph is a reflection from one of the planes in the crystal. The, the plane, you see here, you see some planes. But there are many other planes which you don't see. They are there in the crystal, you can assume. So each plane will give you a reflection. In fact, it's very easy to calculate how many such planes are there in any crystal uh, diffraction. And once you have all these parts, you have to measure the intensity of each of these parts. In a typical virus, you will have to measure 
something like 5 million such parts. You have to measure the intensity. Then you have to have another information. Each of these parts is associated with a phase. You know, because these are waves that have hit the photograph, each wave has a relative phase with respect to the other wave. That means, you see, the wave, you, you may be riding the wave on its crest or troughs. So a wave has a phase factor. And the phases of different reflections are not the same. And you have to figure out these phases. And that process is quite difficult. And there is no direct way. <laughs> direct way of getting the phases. But there are indirect ways. But once you get of all these, then it's a very simple mathematical calculation. Use the intensities, or rather the square root of intensities and phases to calculate the so-called electron density map. Electron density map is really an image of your structure because it shows the distribution of electrons. You know, you know, electrons are not particles; they are clouds. So the distribution of electron cloud in your crystal. Every point, how much electron density is there? That obviously, wherever there are atoms, there is electron density. If there are no atoms and it is close by, the electron density will be essentially zero. Actually, it won't be zero because the crystal has solvent. So there will be solvent electron density, but that is very flat and uh, featureless. So the feature electron density corresponds to your molecule. From this map, you can actually build model of your protein. Then only the real biochemistry starts. You have to ask, what is this protein doing? And how is this protein doing what it is doing? So this is the process of X-ray crystallography. When I came to India, there was no facility for doing even proteins. Absolutely no facility anywhere. So I joined the physics department of IISE. And my property was a large table. I could be proud that maybe this table was used at some point of time by Sir C. V. Raman. Other than that, there was absolutely no facility and I was starting to do virus work. What do I do? Of course, I couldn't do any virus work. I, at that time, you know, uh, just people had learned sequencing, sequencing genomes. And the first pieces of genome sequences started appearing. And for X174, was sequenced, you know, it's a virus. Phi X174 is a virus. And that viral genome was completely sequenced by Sanger in 1980s. And there were some, you know, plant viral sequences, partial plant RNA viruses, RNA viral sequences that were published. You know, it's unbelievable those days when people did sequencing, the whole sequence was printed in the journal, you know, JMB has sequence of, let's say partial sequences of two viruses, say brome mosaic virus and cucumber mosaic virus. They actually are in the uh, journal. There was no data bank for uh, sequences in the 1980s. It's a later development. And now, of course, no journal will accept your sequence. You know, human genome is 3 billion bases long. How can you put it in any book? It will fill the whole library. So they are always deposited in a data bank. But at that time, they were actually in the uh, journal itself. So I could key in these sequences and compare these sequences. See, one, one of the virus, Brome mosaic virus, was a virus that was in Australia. The other is a cucumber mosaic virus, which was in uh, United States. When I compared these two sequences, Actually, the sequences are shown here. See, there was no methods to compare sequences. Today, you have automated methods available freely on the internet, and you could compare this and that and see what is the degree of similarity. Like asking degree of similarity between the two pictures I have shown at the top. You can see what kind of similarity and differences are there. Can you do this? But of course, at that time, I had to write a program to make this uh, uh, statistical comparison and see the significance of it. It turned out that these two are very similar. You know, one virus was in Australia, the other was in the United States, and they were quite different viruses, you know, but the sequences were very similar. So you, I could propose that uh, these two viruses must be related in an evolutionary sense. That was my first publication from India. But then, of course, now we know that many viruses are related. For example, 
common cold virus, polio virus, foot and mouth disease virus. These are all related viruses which have evolved from a ancestor, common ancestor. Like that, you know, there are many other uh, relationships between viruses. Some of them we understand how evolution could have worked here. Some of them we don't understand. You see, for example, rice dwarf virus is a virus that infects rice plants. Blue tongue virus that infects cattle. You know, it, it, it is there in Karnataka also. <laughs> it kills uh, cattle. And these two viruses, you know, one is an animal virus, another is a plant virus. Their structures are very, very similar. They have been, one has been determined in Japan, the other is in England, and the structures are very similar. But sequences are not similar. Why are the structures similar is an enigma for which we don't know the answer. Well, I had an initial problem. See, I when I was in Purdue and ready to come to India, I went to the library and found so-called CMI description you know, uh, of viruses. This is a uh, document brought out by some Commonwealth Institute. It has a list of all viruses reported from India, uh, from the world. You know, every virus, its name and whatever has been done, you know, the shape of the virus, the size of the genome, <clears throat> protein, size of the protein coded by viruses, everything about virus, is given here and its geographical distribution. That was most interesting. Where in the world this virus is found? You don't know if you ask for COVID-19, it is found everywhere in the world. And I think there are maybe one small islands which have not been infected. Otherwise, the whole world has been infected. So its ge geographic distribution is worldwide. Similarly, I was looking for plant viruses. You see, animal virus is more dangerous to work, as the previous speaker was saying if it is infectious to humans. So I had to work on a plant virus. I looked at all the plant viruses and CMI description, and there was no virus in India. You know, no virus was reported to occur in India. I was very surprised, you know, why, why should viruses spare India in contrast to other countries? <clears throat> then I went to a dusty corner of Purdue University and pulled out the so-called Indian Journal of Virology. That is published from Agricultural Research Institute in Delhi. And there I found mention of many viruses. Almost every virus reported in the world were there in India. But why is it not found in CMI description? That, was, that uh, had to be solved. Actually, it turns out that uh, they will include in CMI description only if there has been very definite identification of the virus. But most of the virologists in India had no facility other than just a field where they could plant and infect the plant with viruses. So they detected or identified viruses on the basis of the symptoms and, and the range of plants which they infect. That is not enough for inclusion in CMI description. They, they had to have some zero, at least serological examination. So they were not actually listed in CMI description, but there are obviously many viruses that infect plants in India. So when I came back to India, I was, it, it, you know, because the identification was not definite, I thought I would bring a virus from America and then work on that. So I brought a virus, uh, you know, cucumber mosaic virus that was infecting pumpkins. And I also brought pumpkin seeds from the United States. I planted these seeds in a very temporary glass house like I, uh, made of net. And I infected cucumber plants. They were getting very well infected, the pumpkin plants. Well, well infected, I could purify the virus. Then very soon, the stock of seeds I had brought from America got exhausted. Then I tried to import, and it actually stayed in the customs house for so long a time that the rats had eaten all the seeds. Then I tried to get pumpkin seeds from local market. The virus would not infect that. Then I got seeds from all parts, you know, there are many varieties of pumpkins from all parts of India and tried to infect them, but none of them were getting infected with the American strain. Then I decided I will grow pumpkins, American pumpkins in at the Institute. And there was a large area behind our registrar's house. And with his permission, I planted a huge number of pumpkin seeds there. 
and I, I regularly watered them and I, lots of pumpkins grew. And I thought I would take the seeds and then continue my work. But one day morning when I go, went to the uh, field, all the pumpkins were gone. So obviously it was impossible to work on the American virus. You know, it is impossible to get infect, plants that get infected with that virus. Then I decided I will work on an Indian virus even if its identification is not definite. I went all around India. You know, it was a massive uh, tour around India. I went to Iqusat. I went to Pune Institute of Virology. And I went to uh, Indian Agricultural Research Institute in Delhi. Lucknow, I went and, uh, you know, National Botanical Research Institute in Lucknow. I searched all over the world, I, uh, all over India. But unfortunately, I couldn't find any virus that was very suitable. Then, of course, what is left is uh, go and pray Tirupati Balaji. So I went to Tirupati, and it just turns out that there was a professor who was the head of the virology department in the SV University, Tirupati. He was working on a virus called Sespania mosaic virus. He kindly gave me some infected plants of Sespania. I brought it to Bangalore and grew Sasbania plants. See, Sasbania is something which you, is sold in the market. You can make some kind of soup or, uh, you know, sambar with it. I, they got infected. You can see here Sasbania plant, which is healthy, and this is Sasbania plant, which has been infected. And then I purified the virus. And I had facility at IISC better than what uh, uh, Professor Naidu had in uh, SV University, we had an electron, Philips, Philips electron microscope. This microscope is very less powerful than the microscopes available today. But when we examined in the microscope, they were very neat spherical particles. And actually, I could crystallize this. So I was on my way to do some virus work, except that there was no X-ray machine. Finally, after six or seven years, we got an X-ray machine and a computer. And Actually, it turns out that the computer, even in the central institute, central facility, the computer was really not adequate. You know, sometimes uh, we, had, we had to process those images. And, you know, you cannot measure 5 million reflections uh, manually. It has to be, a day, you know, image processing program. And the image processing program I adopted to our computer, that was a that was not commercially available. No commercially available programs are there. Very good programs. But at that time, whatever program was available, I had to recode it to work on our system. And we were processing. Sometimes, you know, this processing will take so long a time, I would reserve eight hours in the institute uh, com computer center. That I would get once in a month. And then we start our calculation at 10 o'clock in the night. And promptly at five o'clock in the morning, Karnataka uh, Bangalore Corporation will switch off power. And we didn't have an UPS even in the computer center. And so we had a heart attack at 5 a.m. many times, but somehow fortunately we recovered. So this kind of processing anyway, every step had to be reprogrammed because whatever programs were available, they were written for supercomputers, most of them. So we, I had only a PDP-1144 computer, but it was impossible to do anything on that. Finally, in 1990, Intel Corporation came up with a 860 chip. You know, that brought some kind of fast computer uh, possibility. And I could buy one of those uh, tabletop computers on which I could do the computation, which I could not do on our huge mainframe system. And then we managed to solve the virus structure. I won't give you details of how we solved the virus structure, but let us look at the virus. Virus structure, you know, it's absolutely amazing that viruses can do this. Oh, oops, what happened? Don't know. Ah, okay. See, actually the virus has an RNA genome. And the genome is inside a protein coat. The reason why viruses, you see, most simple viruses are like this polio virus or common cold virus. They have an RNA genome. The RNA is inside a protein coat. Because when virus eventually multiplies 
and kills the cell which it, it has infected, it will actually go to other cells and invade them. And traveling of RNA is very uh, risky because RNA is susceptible to cleavage. So it coats the RNA in a protein coat and then the coat along with the coat, the genome travels to other cells. And the coat protein recognizes other susceptible cells and that will allow RNA to enter. You know, the spike protein of coronavirus, that is the one that recognizes epithelial cells in our uh, uh, lung, and then it can infect it. And so we, you start coughing. Like that, this coat protein recognizes the host as well as protect the genome. And the coat protein in most viruses, simple viruses, you know, small viruses, there are big viruses, but most of the viruses that infect us you know, which, which have caused a lot of damage to human race are actually simple viruses. And they have, you see, this green you see here is made up of five protein subunits. You can count one, two, three, four, five. Five protein subunits. Here, you can count, this is made up of six protein subunits. One, two, three, four, five, six. Three red and three blue. So, you see, uh, there are 20 such hexamers. 20 into 6, 120, and 12 such pentamers, 12 into 5, 60, 120 plus 60, 180. Exactly 180 protein subunits are there on the viral coat. Of course, the question is, how does the virus put these 180 proteins together? How does it assemble? That question, of course, will not be answered by the structure. But maybe some clues the structure gives as to how it might be assembling it but that you will have to examine further. But anyway, this was a virus structure. You know, it was made up of pentamers and hexamers. And the principles of this have been worked out in 1962. How does such a construction can occur? See, this has a five-fold symmetry at this point. You know, at this point, oops, I, I keep losing it. Yeah. I don't know. One minute, please. Sure. Ah, okay. Now we are back. So actually, oops, um, there, there's a five-fold axis here, and there's a three-fold axis here. Uh, it is, we call it five-three-two symmetry. That is the most symmetric object possible in the universe. You know, the Sorry, uh, your slide is not visible. Is not visible? Not visible. Wow. Just a minute. <laughs> I have no idea why it's not visible. Let, 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 let's actually wait just one minute. Is it visible now? Not yet. Oh. <laughs> Just a minute. Sure. Why I have come out of, are you he hearing me still? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can see you. But I am not sure whether I have come out of the. No, you are in. It's just that the slide has, uh, maybe you need to share it again. But that I am back in, you see, I, I don't know what is happening here. Just a minute. Oh, I don't know, I, I will restart it. I, I have no idea why it actually, yes. Okay. So um, sorry, you know, so the, the share screen button is it visible? I mean, is it? No, uh, no I am out of this. Uh, you see, I have to restart. I don't know why I am out of it. See, I, actually, I am not in the that mode at all. I, I am back in the. Um. Yeah. 
Sir, now live, sir. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. You can you can uh, go ahead. It's okay. live. All right. You see, uh, it, like, if you take one of these coat proteins, you know, and look at the three-dimensional structure of this, it looks like this. You know, this structure has been referred to as a jelly roll structure. Surprisingly, it turns out that this the same fold of protein is found in many viruses that infect humans. For example, polio virus, common cold virus, you know, foot and mouth disease virus, cucumber mosaic virus, brome mosaic virus, many plant and animal viruses have this kind of protein fold. Why plant and animal viruses have the same fold, same structure? We don't know. Are they evolutionarily related? Their sequences show no signs. So that way, we actually don't know at all. But the amino terminus of this protein was very interesting. Some 65 residues of the amino terminus were disordered. Then there was a piece of structure, ordered piece, which we call beta annulus. The remaining is this beta barrel, whatever, jelly roll barrel. There are 180 subunits in the protein. And the diameter of the virus, which we can get very accurately once the structure is determined, was 288 angstroms. And how is the protein put together? See, if you take three subunits, I have shown one green, one yeah, uh, blue, one red. Actually, three, three subunits, we say crystallographically independent, which means their structures are independent. They don't have to be identical. Actually, out of the 180 subunits, 60 of them have exactly the same conformation. Another 60 of them have similar, but not exactly the same conformation. Yet another 60 of them have a third conformation. In this blue, you see a tile here, which is ordered. This portion is disordered in these two chains. So the three chains are not structurally same. So this is what we call quasi equivalent. And these subunits are held by metal ions. In our case, it is mostly calcium that, bound, that is bound between two subunits and that holds the subunits together. So if you remove these calciums by treatment with EDTA and then add a, a salt, you can precipitate the RNA and the protein comes in soluble fraction. So you can actually separate RNA and protein and you mix them to make the virus again. It is possible to disassemble and assemble the virus. So what is the pathway of this assembly? As I said, one uh, uh, idea was, this was proposed by Steve Harrison from Harvard University when he solved the very first structure of, the, of a virus in the whole world. Um, you know, tomato which is stent virus he solved. And that also has a very similar organization. In fact, it, it's a polypeptide fold also is a beta barrel structure. In the amino termini of the three subunits which are shown in blue here. You see, unfortunately, I've shown it in red here. Or you can say it's red. Uh, and the amino termini come and make hydrogen bonded structure like this. See, this is hydrogen bonded to that. That is hydrogen bonded to this. This is hydrogen bonded to that. It is as though these three are tied. So you can have three these three blues, which are tied to each other. They cannot separate. And that blue interacts with this blue here. And that, you know, like that, if you actually, uh, the virus can assemble using this beta annulus into a large capsid with large holes. See, there is no disconnection. Everything is connected here. This is where the beta annulus is, and this is where the dimeric contact is. So the whole virus can assemble because of this annulus. So Steve Allison proposed that it is this annulus that controls the assembly. And he even produced a movie on how these tiles can come and interact and the virus capsid can get formed. You see, actually, I just also want to tell you that you see some pictures in all these photographs and there are the students who have contributed to all this work. Then, you know, because this tile seems to be very important and it was also suggested by Steve Harrison, what would happen if you cut the tile? You know, molecular biology allows you to uh, trim the protein as you like. So first 65 residues were actually removed. You know, we cloned the uh, viral whole genome and then in that core protein gene and then removed the amino terminus and expressed this uh, uh, gene in E. coli. You know, you can express the viral 
coat protein in E. coli and that assembled. But then it did not assemble into the virus of the kind that we had seen. This is a wild type virus. But the assembled particle had only 60 protein subunits instead of 180. And Sangeeta determined the structure of these uh, smaller particles. And you can see the electron density map here. It's so clear. You know, there is no doubt that it's a tryptophan, this is a uh, uh, tyrosine. Like that, you can even identify the residues. Even if you did not know the sequence, you can read the extra sequence. So that was very nice. And we now know the tile. If there is a tile, it makes this kind of particle. If you cut off the tile, it makes this kind of particle. So maybe the tile is the most important. Is it so? Then actually, we did another experiment. We kept a long chain, but except the residues that were, uh, you know, make this beta annulus, the residue 48 to 58. The 11 residues alone were removed. Then actually it made the same T equals three particles, which means there was no need for these residues. It did not have the beta annulus. So without beta annulus, we got particles of this kind. So obviously you see that idea is not correct. This uh, 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 beta annulus controls the assembly is not actually right. Uh, anyway, uh, we could establish a path of assembly. Then we also thought, you know, it's a fun experiment. Is it possible to disrupt the virus such that it cannot assemble at all? We had an observation that at the five-fold axis of the virus, there are five tryptophanes. These will be very, you know, this is a very strong hydrophobic interaction. What would happen if you replace this uh, tyrosine with something like a charged residue, like lysine or arginine? That is what uh, we did. And then, lo and behold, actually it uh, uh, cannot assemble at all. That uh, protein, if you express in E. coli, will not assemble into virus-like particles. But it assembles into dimeric, uh, uh, you know, dimers of protein. And we could determine the structure of this dimer. And it turns out that this dimer is exactly like this dimer here you know, this one blue dimer, it is like that blue dimer <clears throat> or whatever. So it's a type of dimer we can identify. So assembly should really start with such dimeric proteins. So we could propose a path. Let me actually go ahead, you know, for lack of time. Then can we actually use this virus particle for any practical applications? This is essentially uh, work of my wife Savitri, but we also, she, she did the biochemical part, I did the structural part. You know, there is a staph RES B domain, which is known to bind IgG. Can we remove the tile that is disordered and put B domain of staph RES in the viral protein and express it in E. coli? Will you get a capsid containing, you know, 180 or 60 copies of B domain? And that was done, that means the tile was cut, and in its place the B domain of staff RES was stitched, and then it was expressed in E. coli. We could purify the uh, expressed protein in two ways. One was because we have a, there was a hexahistidine tag in the expressed protein, we could use nickel NTA affinity chromatography. I am sorry if you are not a biochemist, you may not find it uh, very obvious, but anyway, I just want to point out that there were two ways. See, because viruses are big particles, they are much heavier than proteins. So actually, if you spin in an ultracentrifuge, you can precipitate the virus, but the proteins do not get precipitation. So in, this is what we call differential centrifugation. You can purify virus-like particles using differential centrifugation. If the, the protein expressed with B domain has assembled into particles, it could be purified by ultracentrifugation. But if the assembly has been broken, it's a small protein, then you can purify by nickel NTA chromatography. Actually, we could purify using both. And it turns out that this nickel NTA chromatography was dimeric. This pelleted virus was, uh, uh, you know, uh, virus-like particle. So actually, it, it, it just means that when you express this protein in E. coli, you have both virus-like particles and dimers of protein. And 
that was surprising. But anyway, we could now get uh, virus-like particles. Now it is expressing a foreign protein, you know, piece of foreign protein, some 60 residues of a foreign protein. Then Savitri has cloned many other proteins in the virus, you know, attached many other proteins and expressed them. For those of you who are not biochemists, I would say that we have created pseudo-virus-like particles with pieces of peptide from various sources. See, if these peptides are from another virus, then injecting this uh, particle should raise antibodies against another virus, and which can actually be used as a, uh, a vaccine. So you can create vaccine using virus particles. Well, anyway, we wanted to solve the structure of these foreign uh, epitope, and we could crystallize one of this, that is the dimer, dimer we got, we crystallized this dimer. But when we solved the crystal structure, we found that it is normal, not a dimer anymore. It was actually, when in the, under the crystallization condition, it has assembled into a virus-like particle. And we could actually determine the structure of this virus-like particle and, uh, you know, demonstrate that it is possible to get virus-like particles expressing epitopes from other, you know, pieces of polypeptide from other viruses or whatever, you know, you can, whatever peptide you want to express, put it as part of the viral core protein, express it, it will assemble as particles. So she constructed many such particles and you can see that in the electron microscope, you will see all these pseudo recombinants, you know, these are assembly products from virus containing different peptides. These can be very useful, and it actually she has shown that these virus particles enter human cells very easily. For whatever reason it is, the, a penetration through the barrier mem membrane of the cell is possible for these particles. So potentially you can use these particles as vaccine candidates. Well, <clears throat> anyway, that's what I just want to summarize what we did on viruses. I, I won't go into any more details. But unfortunately, you know, at that time we retired. And so this work, if it had continued, it would have been a very good source of vaccines for various diseases. But somebody else might do. And I am sure there are other people who are now trying to use viral capsids for vaccine production. Then you see, when we set up crystallization for this uh, protein, we got a crystal which no matter what we tried, we could not solve the structure. You know, then there is a procedure developed by Michael Rasman, you know, the professor with whom I worked, which was a method where you could determine a structure if a similar structure is known. For example, if you know the structure of a protein from human, let's say hemoglobin, human hemoglobin structure is known. You know, somebody in Madras, you know, because there was a park just opposite to the Gindi campus where there's a crystallography lab, they had crocodiles. So one of the crystallographers in Madras went to the crocodile park and got some crocodile blood and she purified hemoglobin from that blood and crystallized that hemoglobin. When you, while she wanted to solve the hemoglobin structure, you, she could use human hemoglobin structure as a starting model and then derive the accurate structure of uh, tartice, uh, 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 alligator uh, hemoglobin. Like that, if you have a similar protein, you can actually solve the structure of your protein. We use the viral capsid, obviously, because what you have crystallized was virus capsid. So, but it wouldn't get solved. Then there was a computer wizard in my, who joined my lab. I asked him to determine the structure using every structure in the protein data bank. If there is any structure in the protein data bank, it should solve. It just turns out that he, when he did it, he could actually solve the structure. And there were the proteins that he used were called ding proteins. They, they are not viral proteins at all. And they actually, he collected the data and determined the structure. The electron density map was so good that he could read the sequence, amino acid sequence from the X-ray electron density map. And once he had the sequence of this protein, he could actually blast this protein. You know, there is a pro program called BLAST, which compares your protein sequence with every sequence in the protein data bank. 
So she did, he did this blast, and actually it, it was it, the sequence was very similar to uh, a, a protein, the, the, the ding protein. But actually, in the protein in the uh, Swiss Prat database, the protein which was uh, identified as identical to nearly identical to the protein solved by us was listed as an alkaline phosphatase. But you see, here was a dilemma. Sequence-wise, the X-ray sequence, that means red amino acid sequence read using the X-ray map. This is completely experimental sequence based on X-ray map. You know, they, they are quite, a, if the electron density map is good, your sequence could be very accurate, except for residues like glutamine and glutamate. You know, that uh, maybe sometimes you may make, make a mistake. But otherwise, uh, you can read other residues which have different shape with quite a great confidence if your electron density map is very good. So we got the amino acid sequence from the electron density map. That amino acid sequence matched with a protein which was listed as an alkaline phosphatase. But our uh, structure solution suggested, you see, what he succeeded was using these so-called ding proteins. These ding proteins are phosphate carriers, you know, they transport phosphate into the cell. So this protein was actually a phosphate carrying protein, not an alkaline phosphatase. So like that, you see the, what was uh, marked, uh, what was, uh, uh, you know, what, what was listed in protein Swiss PRA database was not correct. So it could, it, it could be corrected because of uh, this work. In other words, you see, we could identify a protein completely based on crystallographic work, which is very nice. And I <clears throat> just want to spend, uh, I don't know, how, how am I doing on time? I, I mean, do I still have a lot of time or very um, at the uh, end of my time? Uh, we have about five minutes or so. Okay, okay, uh, all right. So I, I want to, uh, this may be the last part. You see, as I said, this is a journey of 40 years. So I, I, I can show you many sceneries which are beautiful. Now, I again come back to Raman and Ramasheshan. You know, Ramasheshan is one of the most brilliant students of Raman, exactly like G. and Ramasheshan. He had developed a method called anomalous dispersion. You know, some wavelengths, some atoms become crazy and scatter X-rays in a crazy way. So they are called anomalous scatterers. And Ramasheshan did a lot of work on anomalous scattering. And he showed how to solve structures using this anomalous data. That means you have to collect the data at a, at a wavelength of X-rays where the atom is not crazy, you know, normal wavelength. And then you tune the wavelength to another wavelength where the atom behaves anomalously. And then collect the X-ray diffraction data. Using these two data, you can solve the structure of the protein. That is what Ramasheshan had shown. That was in 1950s and 60s. But then that method was stored in deep store, you know, for a long time because our X-ray lab has X-ray machines which produce X-rays of a single wavelength. You cannot have other wavelengths. So there was no way you can collect data. But then in the 1980s, people developed the physicists developed so-called synchrotrons. See, these are particle accelerators. If you take a picture from the air, it looks like this. In this, uh, there is a uh, uh, tunnel inside here, almost a mile long, kilometer long tunnel, in which electrons are made to go very fast around this. They go so fast that they will make seven uh, rounds around Earth in one second. They uh, almost 99% velocity of light, electrons will be spinning in synchrotron. These machines were built by physicists for physics experiments. Then it turns out that when electrons go in a circle, they emit radiation, x-radiation, you know, x-rays of all wavelengths. So that is called synchrotron radiation. And you can select any radiation you want, any wavelength you want for collecting data. So in some sense, Ramasheshan, what he has suggested, you know, you could collect the data at one wavelength where atoms are all scattering normally and then change the wavelength where one of the atoms becomes crazy. You should not have all atoms crazy. That wouldn't happen also because different atoms become crazy at different wavelengths. 
So, you know, we all use selenium atom because selenium can be made incorporated into your protein very easily in the place of cysteine, in the, uh, in the place of cysteine. So actually, we had started a project on a protein. You see, this protein is found in red gram, whatever, uh, you know, quesarzal. Um, see, people, this, this quesarzal is a very good crop. In a sense, it can grow with very little water. And it is protein rich. But if you eat this quesarzal for a long time, you develop a disease called lacerism, where you lose control over your legs. So we were, we were interested in this protein because if, if you can make some modification, you know, it, it, may be, it may help to evolve plants that have the same pulse, but without the toxin. So this protein is just responsible for production of a toxin in the plant. So we had started this work in the early 2000s. But this structure could not be solved by any method because you see the some crystallographic problem was there. Every time we crystallized, the crystal was slightly different. So they, we call them, uh, they, they are not isomorphous crystals. Then you cannot actually solve the structure by any means. So we 10 years, we couldn't solve the structure. Then DBT made an arrangement with uh, the synchrotron in Grenoble where we could send crystals to France and collect data at different wavelengths, you know, one at normal wavelength, one at anomalous wavelength. And then, lo and behold, when we got the data, we could immediately solve the structure. So here, one, the Rajaram started the structure, struggled for uh, five, six years and gave up. And then after another five years, Shweta Jai in my lab, by then we had access to synchrotron, we got the data from synchrotron and we could solve the structure. And of course, the structure we have published, many papers on the structure, it was very nice. So I, in some sense, Amashation was responsible for me to come to Bangalore. And I am ending this uh, story with a method which was developed by Amashation, but which was actually uh, put on hold because we don't, don't have radiation of all wavelengths. When synchrotron came, this method became very powerful. Now it turns out that this method is the most powerful method to determine protein structures, and everybody now solves the protein structures more by anomalous dispersion than by uh, the so-called isomorphous replacement, which was developed in England by Max Perutz. So you can see the Indian contribution to crystallography, which makes us very proud of Ramachandran and Ramachandran. You know, Ramachandran turned confirmational analysis into cottage industry, as somebody said at some point of time. Today's molecular dynamics, you know, drug design, all hail from the initial confirmational analysis that Ramachandran developed. So these people have contributed greatly to science, and some award in their name is really very precious, and I am very grateful to. Sastra for uh, giving me this award. As I said, obviously, I have a long journey of 40 years, and I, I have to stop uh, halfway through. But it's okay. The, the other stories are also interesting, but sometimes maybe I will visit Sastra and give a series of seminars on other aspects of protein structure. Finally, you see, obviously, it has been a 40-year journey, and we have worked on two viruses the Sasbania mosaic virus and Faisalis mortal virus. But I presented only the results of Sasbania mosaic virus. We also have worked on a large number of proteins and I presented work on only one protein. And these are the people who are associated with the two, uh, yes, uh, one virus, another virus and proteins. So huge number of people for whom, which is uh, whatever I presented is really the fruit of all those. And finally, the key person who is responsible for my courage to take up virus work is my wife and collaborator, H.S. Savitri. She has done all the biochemical work and I have done all the structural work and the team has been really marvelous. I thank her and I thank all my colleagues and I thank Sastra for this award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mothri, for the wonderful talk.
um, giving a marathon overview of your uh, career trajectory over 40 years, uh, starting from where you started from the scratch uh, to now uh, a full-fledged lab, which has pursued uh, several important questions in uh, viral structure. Uh, your talk was uh, illuminating in many perspectives, and I think I'll just quickly consolidate uh, what I took away uh, as the key points for young budding researchers like me. Um, one was that the, the entire pursuit of science is driven by curiosity and questions that we ask, and the techniques that we adopt should not be a limiting factor. So I can see that you had adopted a wide range of techniques starting from molecular biology, biochemistry, bioinformatics, extrachistography to address the uh, question uh, that, that drove you. And the importance of collaboration, collaborative works, that also uh, is something that uh, we, we will uh, definitely learn from you. Um, I, uh, I'll, there's, uh, just I'll just have one question in the interest of time. Uh, the question is um, on the intrinsically disordered regions of proteins. Um, so how do we deal with these intrinsically disordered proteins? Because nowadays we have come to appreciate that these regions are uh, playing an important role. So how do you deal with it structurally? So that's well, the... You see, intrinsically disordered proteins obviously have become hot proteins. Because, see, uh, in fact, it's very interesting. There are, if you don't take coat protein, you take other proteins expressed. You see, vi viral genome, you know, it's very small. It actually is a wonder, wonder how, let's say, polyoviral genome. It's just 5,000 nucleotides long. But it can infect humans and cause devastation. Human genome is 3 billion bases long. How can such a small genome code for functions that are devastating to the host. That is a very fantastic thing. And actually it turns out that these intrinsically desirable proteins are more in viruses than in other places. Because if a protein folds into a very definite structure, it will have a very definite function, you know, based on this, like proteases. You know, they have histidine, aspartate, and uh, uh, histidine, aspartate, and serine, right. serine proteases in ex exact juxtaposition. So it can only do that function, but intrinsically desirable proteins can assume different structures in the context of interaction with different proteins. And then they assume a structure and they have a function. So you can actually determine the structure of an intrinsically desirable protein if, it, if you know what is the protein to which it interacts, with which it interacts and assumes a structure. Then you can determine the structure. It will be a very flexible structure. You know, if you do MD simulation, you will see that the thermal uh, the vibrations are more for the attached structure. But anyway, such, that way they have solved some structures. In fact, we have published, uh, it was up, mainly Savitri has published a large number of papers on intrinsically desirable proteins. Recently, they determined the structure of an intrinsically desirable protein by somehow stabilizing it. And that was an NMR structure in collaboration with Siddharth Sharma. And that has been published recently. So we can do, it is very difficult. See, if you do CD, it will tell you that it is disorder, uh, circular decryism. So if you predict uh, protein three-dimensional structure, you have many prediction program. You know, fold index is one of the programs which tell you how foldable the polypeptide chain is. It's freely available on the internet. And that shows you that it is not foldable. See, it will be rich in charged amino acids. Therefore, don't, it doesn't, those charges do not allow the protein to fold. So, you, in fact, actually, this bioinformatics tool is really powerful. You know, if you use it, it will certainly show, in fact, even in on proteins which are ordered, it will show you the regions which may be intrinsically disordered. You see, even in regular well-folded proteins, there are small segments which are disordered. And sometimes this disordered portion may be more important than the ordered portion. So that way, a lot of knowledge is coming up on intrinsic disordered regions of polypeptides. But in intrinsic, the so-called intrinsic disordered, intrinsically disordered proteins, the entire protein is disordered. There is no ordered region at all. You know, a mini, Soda Mini has 
been working on this pro this problem from the bioinformatics point of view but we have approached it more by more in terms of structural point of view but you cannot crystallize them so you cannot do extra crystal structure but if you know what is the interacting partner you may be able to crystallize a complex such complexes other people have done but we have not been successful in such uh, work okay thank you um so just one uh, last uh, uh, thing what would be your uh, advice to the research students of today oh i i think they i tell you i was asked to by ramajeshan to come to bangalore and initiate studies on viruses i told you that i felt like a, a person without leg asked to uh, go at, on top of mount everest it was actually a mad thing to accept but i did and i didn't fail i i did could determine the structure of a virus so don't underestimate yourself you know have confidence you take a challenging project you know you don't have to compromise and take simple project uh, i i wish i could tell you more about uh, uh, the distribution of credit as you uh, you know uh, medavar zone you see have you heard of medavar zone Mm. if you take very simple projects you will succeed but you will get very little credit if you take extremely difficult projects you may not be able to solve it at all and you don't get any credit so you have to select a problem which is challenging but which is still you know if you, with consistent effort is solvable that is what it's called metaver zone you know obviously if you take some problems you cannot solve them for example see uh, uh, the last uh, uh, the theorem uh, the fermat's last theorem see there are no two numbers whose cubes add up to the uh, cube of another integral number that proof was not made for 200 years for from great mathematicians in the world so that way we cannot take such projects obviously we have to be wise enough to see when a problem is completely out of our reach but we should not of course uh, you know much more than what we think we can do we will be able to do like that if you take up a such i mean you should not take easy projects take difficult projects but still of course don't take too difficult project which in which you will fail how do you do that that needs some wisdom you know some experience so i would advise you to take up challenging problems and work on them consistently otherwise you the credit you get is going to be very low See, if you take easy projects, of course you will succeed, but then you won't get much credit. So you have to take difficult projects, and you have to have the courage. So develop the courage. One way to do is to visit a lab. We is doing very good work. You know, this is one advantage of uh, some training, at least uh, earlier. Now it is less important to go abroad because projects done in many labs outside India. were our front line projects but we we were not doing front line projects we didn't have money you see we didn't have facilities but now there is enough facility in at least the elite labs in the country you know like ncbs or ccmb or nii or iisc you have same facilities as what westerners have so there is no reason why we should do projects which are less demanding you know we can take a challenging project still i would say like let's see venki ramakrishnan solved the structure of ribosome if you take ribosome structure in india i know that you will not succeed in 50 years because you need synchrotron on a daily basis see you you will have to go and make trips to synchrotron uh, on very regularly and uh, you, you know they, they collect 30 million reflections and process them so you need much more facilities and you know you cannot take up the project but you have to just do not take up do not take up very small projects you know that's what i said you have to develop the wisdom of finding a challenging problem which is still doable that needs some experience and i hope you will get the experience as you go along okay Thank you, thank you, Professor Murthy, and thank you everyone for joining uh, this wonderful talk by Professor Murthy. I'm sure all of you had an immense, uh, an immense immersive experience in the experiences of Professor Murthy. Um, thank you, and uh, with that, uh, we bring this session of the talk to a closure. Uh,
Um, thank you. Ma'am, now live, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we are on the afternoon session of uh, this year's Science Day lectures. And we have two eminent speakers who are going to give us a lot of information on areas that are at the interface of chemistry and biology. We are going to start the afternoon session with a, a person who is no new name uh, in the field of uh, bioorganic chemistry. For the benefit of the youngsters, I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction about this very eminent speaker, Professor Sandeep Verma, who is an outstanding bioorganic chemist who completed his MSc in organic chemistry with a gold medal from Benares Hindu University, and later on uh, completed his PhD from the University of Illinois Medical Center. He had postdoctoral stints at uh, Johns Hopkins University and uh, later at the Max Planck Institute for Experimental Medicine. He joined as, uh, a, he's currently a professor in the Indian Institute of uh, Technology, Kanpur, and he's also the Sri Devaraj Endor Chair Professor. He uh, serves as uh, the Secretary of the Science and Engineering Research Board of the Department of Science and Technology where he assumed charge in April uh, 2019. His research primarily revolves around various facets of uh, bioorganic chemistry, programmable soft matter, looking into peptides and protein self-assembly and uh, the amyloidogenic pathway. And I think today his talk is going to also focus upon uh, an area which is of great interest to his group, which is on synthetic peptides in chemical neuroscience and stem cell engineering. He uh, is uh, a well world renowned uh, scientist and he has a long list of accolades and I'm not going to read all of that for the interest of time, but I would def definitely like to mention that he has received several prestigious awards, including the one today that was conferred upon him, the SASTA CNR Award for Excellence in Chemistry and Material Science. We look forward to an exciting one hour session from him and I request all uh, the participants uh, to benefit from the information shared and post your queries uh, in the chat box and the professor will clarify the, your doubts at the end of this talk. Over to you, Professor Sandeep Verma. Namaskar, uh, Professor Uma, that was a very kind introduction on your part. Uh, I'm so thankful to you. I am so thankful to Professor Vedya Subramanyam Sastra University, the jury for this wonderful opportunity to receive an award in the name of an icon and an iconic university, both. And also uh, being together with uh, one of my very dear colleague, Professor Govind Raju, whose work I have the biggest respect. So it's a, it's a double or triple times the joy that I have today in sharing the research what we do at IIT Kanpur. So please allow me to share my slides, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, sir. So I hope uh, you are able to see the full screen and the voice is clear. So as uh, uh, Professor Omar pointed out, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about how very simple, short synthetic peptides could serve as you know, unique tools in interrogating problems related to chemical neuroscience, how they could be used to uh, unravel some of the problems or some of the exciting excitement in stem cell engineering. And as this award also deals with material science, at the last moment, I thought of you know, introducing some of our recent research, which also deals with material science, so that it gives you a nice overview of synthetic chemistry how it is used in chemical biology as well as contemporary material science. So as it was pointed out, I, I belong to Department of Chemistry with affiliations to nanoscience. And more recently, I've been invited to join uh, Mehta Family Center for Engineering in Medicine at IIT Kanpur. And I am currently on deputation to SCRB DST Government of India. So uh, let me pay my respect to someone who I really admire, not only for his 
science, which is, you know, world renowned, the Bharat Ratna Professor Siyana Rao. He has been most kind, most affectionate, and also a very uh, a gentle mentor who has seen some of us grow in the system in the academia once we return from abroad, right, to settle down in academia, go through the process of uh, receiving funds, writing good projects. So you always find Professor Rao as somebody who you can trust when you're giving lectures in front of him, you get excellent ideas. And he has been most kind. And what I show you today as a picture is when uh, I visited along with him, uh, the UK, the Royal Society in the UK, and, and we had, uh, so this picture is from, from those days from that year. So with due respect to Professor Rao and thanks to Sasa University, let me start by uh, telling you what exactly we do in our laboratory. And this particular slide, uh, so it gives you three sections which you can see from left to right on your screen. One talks about assemblies, peptides, proteins, which give you, it gives you a certain kind of a biological flavor to a research problem, right? In the middle, we have structured surface, such as a water repellent lotus leaf, where you see the leaf and the spherical droplets, which are not really adhering or, or they are they are making the leaf totally wet, but they are, you know, sort of the wettability is limited because of the hydrophobicity, because of the structure of this leaf. And on your extreme right, you have batteries. And this is where we have recently gravitated towards by creating uh, biodegradable batteries, biodegradable capacitors by using nucleic acid fragments and how we can use nucleic acid fragments treat them with uh, or nucleobases, have uh, lithium or have uh, such metal ions in contact with these nucleobases and we create supercapacitors out of uh, such, such molecules. So simple chemistry, but more focus on application, or more focus on direct application, which could be of a great relevance in the translational world. So before I start scientific talk, let me thank the people who actually perform the experiments who are responsible for, for much of the curiosity driven thought process in the group and list of PhD students are there. A couple of them have just graduated within 10 days back, Dr. Swati Sharma and Dr. Naren Singh. And uh, we have a, I have a great set of postdoctoral fellows about uh, six, seven at the moment. They are absolutely brilliant. And while I'm away from Kanpur, they are the ones who are holding the fort, if you will, and, and making sure that the research is, is on the right track. And of course, uh, we are always uh, very thankful to collaborators and funding agencies. They are not, their names are here at appropriate time. I may mention their name, but if I forget, but all young colleagues have to realize that it is the day of collaboration. You have to go beyond your normal domain. You have to go beyond your normal set of understanding, talk to people so that you know, your research can come out with a different flavor each time. And, and that really adds value to, to research. That really adds value to the publication. So with this, uh, thank you slide, which is right here. Let me jump directly into one of the key topics that I wanted to discuss with you today, which is chemical neuroscience, right? So if, with a picture of neuron and with the knowledge that we are, uh, our, our brain, our brain related function is driven by neurotransmitters, I'm going to focus on a very simple gaseous, gaseous neurotransmitter, which is nitric oxide. You may have heard about a lot many uh, neurotransmitters, but nitric oxide, surprisingly, if some of you do not know about it, it is a gaseous molecule, a simple molecule, which serves as a neuromodulator and a neuroprotective agent in our, in our systems. And it is responsible for signaling events. It is responsible for regulation of neuronal metabolism, growth, and you know a number of, of processes, downstream biological processes, which are possible once this particular gas is generated within the desired uh, tissue type, right? So how is it synthesized? The first question is how, nitric oxide is synthesized in our tissues or in our cells. So if you look at this particular slide, you start with this, uh, with L-arginine and with the help of, with the, with the help of enzymatic transformation, you convert L-arginine to nitric oxide with citrulline as a side product, right? Citrulline is a side product, nitric oxide is generated. I'm not going into the cofactors responsible and how Critically, it is controlled, but suffice to mention that once you synthesize nitric oxide, uh, 
This gaseous molecule, it is very easy for it, it to diffuse in various compartments and show its biological activity. But if you look at the biological activity, as I had mentioned, it is a neuromodulator, neuroprotective agent, but it all depends the, the concentrate, concentration at which you synthesize this particular gas, right? So if it is synthesized a lot too much, then you have oxidative stress where nitric oxide can interact with oxygen and provide you such kind of species which are peroxynitrite and that could funnel down or that could be used to nitrate tyrosine. And then what you get is R nitro tyrosine or R tyrosine and what is eventually going to happen is that you observe neurotoxicity. If you, it is also possible that you can take nitric oxide if it is in too much of quantities, you can nitrosylate a thiol, an essential cellular thiol can get nitrosylated. And in, in such cases, either it could, or, or such type of nitrosylated thiol can either lead to neurotoxicity or it can also offer you neuroprotection depending on the kind of amount that you generate from the, the parent thiol. Now, what, what happens is once it is synthesized in the donor cell, nitric oxide can diffuse to a target cell. And what you see in the right-hand side panel is that it can activate SGC, which stands for soluble guanolate cyclase, and GTP gets converted to cyclic GMP, which has its own downstream processes because of its second messenger action. You could see synaptic plasticity, or you could see smooth muscle relaxation and whole lot of properties or downstream physiological manifestations that are associated with, with nitric oxide synthesis. Now, if you think nitric oxide as a, as a gas which is essential for our body, and if we are running low on nitric oxide, we may have to take exogenously. So it is possible, we all know that we take disparin to take uh, aspirin, right? We take um, capsule, tablets, injectables for various drugs, right? But how to deliver a gas? Nitric oxide is a gas. So inevitably, we have to think about organic reactions. We have to think about organic substrates that could be converted to nitric oxide. So we would eat those organic substrates. Obviously, we cannot take gaseous you know, inhalation. And essentially, we would have to generate nitric oxide in just the right amount so that we minimize toxicity and we maximize the beneficial you know, action of nitric oxide. So delivery remains a big question. And here, uh, uh, when you look at delivery, there are few approaches which came to our mind when we were conceptualizing this problem. One, uh, is this, uh, one, uh, one structure is shown here. So in an unrelated paper long back in about 2008 from, uh, uh, from cell cycle, this particular nitro derivative of aspirin was described. You see, so you have acetyl salicylic acid, right? So the, the acid part is now connected to this this organic nitrate type of derivative, and it is acetylate, acetylated at the phenolic part. So it is your classic aspirin lookalike molecule, yet what we are appending here is an organic nitrate, right? So it was done for something else, but we thought that it's a good idea if you look at this structure in more detail, it, is, it was actually being used for, for a variety of applications, but not really towards focused delivery of nitric oxide, right? It was nitric oxide donating aspirin, but not being used in neuronal uh, cells or, or the activities that we wanted to study. So we thought that's a, it's a good starting point and we should use this particular you know, design strategy, which donates nitric oxide within the cell types as our organic, you know, sort of as the structures that we would synthesize for future applications. Delivery of nitric oxide is not only limited to the structures that I have shown. What has also been known that certain NO8s are, are described in literature, which can be connected to carbohydrate residue the way it is shown here. And this, this, this particular molecule, when it is interacted or when it is acted upon by beta galactosidase, it eventually releases nitric oxide. And it has been shown that such type of strategy has been used to deliver nitric oxide to the segment of mouse eye. Very simple molecule. You take a sugar, you take, take such type of appendage, which is eventually going to release nitric oxide. It is inevitably going to be water soluble. You can have the right kind of, you know, uh, um, 
uh, a preparation that would allow you to to deliver the concentration that is required in this particular case in mouse eye right so we were quite excited about it that we have had a, a good a good literature reference of modified aspirin and the possibility of using such type of systems in in vivo that gave us an idea that we can go ahead and create something of our own right so the molecular design that i'm going to talk to you today involved what is shown here we took uh, salicylic acid as the starting point and we did some kind of uh, uh, flipping if you look at the structure carefully instead of acetylating the phenol we connected it to a molecule that would eventually bear the organic nitrate that is eventually going to be our nitric oxide release trigger right and we used the acid part the carboxylic acid part to connect a dipeptide in this particular case ditryptophan dipeptide the reason is that we have used in the past the ditryptophan dipeptide for self assembly and eventual preparation of a self assembled structure that is going to protect your molecule which is eventually going to nitric oxide while it is being put in cell culture right and the hydrophobicity of tryptophan indol residues would allow you to have a safe passage of these molecules or the ensemble that you prepare inside a given tissue type or inside a neuron so this was the molecular design so with the dipeptide assembly you would create such type of structure where these and indole residues are going to be interdigitized inside a more hydrophobic core and the hydrophilic core which will be projecting outside would contain such type of organic nitrate so that you are protecting things you are making an ensemble so that the release of nitric oxide can occur over a period of time so that you can you can tune the release concentration of nitric oxide to always remain on the side of beneficial concentration rather than towards the cytotoxic concentration so uh, for students not for my colleagues when you make these structures i cannot emphasize that we prepared close to 25 derivatives and this one worked the best right so when i show you a structure please do not think that oh this is uh, you know one could get to such structures in a jiffy but the idea is to continuously try and one of those structures would give you the right kind of you know you know combination and the idea was that if we reacted with cellular thiols we would nitrosate a cellular thiol and eventually that nitrosylated thiol side chain would eventually release nitric oxide so here is the the, the design here is the the concept of ensemble as well as the nitric oxide release trigger triggered by none other than endogenous thiol so we are not adding anything from outside endogenous thiol cellular thiols would do the job right so first of all we started working on nit uh, nitrite and and release mechanism so here is our molecule we took glutathione which is endogenous thiol and in a test tube assay basically using grease reagent grease reagent we we figured out how much nitrite anion are going to be released that are going to be eventually used to nitrosylate our thiol side chains eventually right so the the mechanism is shown here we will not go into the mechanism but if you if you take the conjugate if you take glutathione if you you incubate in phosphate buffer at certain ph you can actually quantify the release of nitrite anions that would give you an idea of the reaction rates how quickly the reaction occurs so that you can tune fine tune the concentrations uh, that are going to be eventually used for nitric oxide delivery so here is the uh, a grease assay where we have used uh, either uh, concentration of glutathione as as one of the parameters so it's starting all the way from 0.5 millimolar to 5 millimolar and finally putting 1 millimolar glutathione as our concentration to eventually see what kind of release one can expect if you con if if you interact our conjugate with the glutathione which has a thiol side chain that is eventually going to degrade our organic nitrate get nitrosylated and release nitric oxide as a product right so i would i would not show you too much of a uh, a uh, in vitro i mean i will not show you test tube assays but we directly go inside neurons so what we did is that we took neuroblastoma cell line which is neuro 2a cell line and if you if you take a zero concentration of our conjugate 
you see a basal fluorescence, right? A basal fluorescence is there. And if you add 50 micromolar of our conjugate, you let the reaction happen and you monitor over a period of time, almost two days, what you find is that you achieve a maximal fluorescence, which is much more than the basal fluorescence being shown by neuroblastoma to a two a cell line, right? Neuro two a cell line. So it means that definitely there is a role of our conjugate, which when present, at a concentration of 50 micromolar would give you such type of release. So what we did is that we took neuroblastoma cell line, we add, added uh, uh, DAF, DAF acetate as our fluorescent dye, and starting from zero hours all the way to 48 hours, we found a nice bell-shaped curve that gave us a maximal fluorescence output about at about 30 hours, which came down at around 48 hours. So what it meant was that we started slowly releasing nitric oxide, which eventually when it bound to the dye, which was inside the cell, you could track it with the help of uh, fluorescence. And that told us that our molecule is going inside the neurons. It is, it is getting degraded or rather activated by thiol and we are able to see the uh, the fluorescence output uh, a, a, over a period of two days right that was a very interesting experiment and what we also did next to it was that we looked at the neuronal cell culture under microscope right so if you look at the top two panels top two panels what you are seeing is just the neuro 2a neurons which look the way they, they look, uh, 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 say, at day one or day two, uh, uh, if you can see the, the, the um, arrow, you see the neuronal body. You do not see anything else over a period of two days so that there's a quiescent cell setup. They are growing at a certain rate. There is not much happening from day one to day two under control conditions. The molecule not being added, just the buffer is added in these control experiments, right? Now you add compound one, the structure I have already shown, to level of 50 micromolar, which was the, which was the concentration we tested. And within day one and day two, if you were to compare the top two panels with bottom two panels, I don't have to tell this audience, you start seeing what are, what are called as this hair-like growth coming out of the neuronal body they are called as neurites, right? Neurites are proteinaceous, you know, sort of growths that are going to emanate from neuronal surface. And what it meant was that nitric oxide or the molecule that is carrying the organic nitrate appendage that is eventually going to release nitric oxide is doing something super special that you are seeing or you are kickstarting the growth of neurite, which was not present in under control conditions. Right, so two days means I mean you see enormous amount of uh, uh, this neurite growth, and if you were to zoom it out, right, under control day day one and control day two, you see just the neuronal bodies, but at day one and day two, you see this hair-like growth coming out, and that gave us an indication that something is going on, right? The molecule is getting released. I mean uh, delivered. Nitric oxide possibly is getting released because we have a fluorescence data. We now have a data where you can actually so see overexpression of a protein, which is eventually going to give you the growth of neurite. So that has, that had, you know, pointing us in the right direction. And it was published uh, a couple, few years back in chemical science. So now time had come basically to figure out what exactly is going on, right? If, if these dendrites are coming out of neuronal body, then definitely there must be an effect on neuronal cytoskeleton by these nitric oxide. And of course, that was, uh, we eventually figured out that we looked at actin, right? Actin is a protein which is essential for neuronal polarity. It is essential for cargo transport. And more importantly, for our particular study, it is very critical for neurite growth. So these hair-like structures that are coming from neuronal body, they actin is responsible for, for neurite growth. And this picture basically shows you how the, the axonal domains or axonal body is covered with this, this actin and the cytoskeleton is such that actin is making ring-like structures the, along the axonal uh, stem, right? So uh, uh, this was uh, uh, a test that we wanted to do 
to figure out which proteins are actually getting overexpressed because of our molecule because of nitric oxide and we we started with this experiment by taking the the neuro 2a cell line we treated it with with our molecule we went directly to assess how much actin is being produced if at all by using dp as the nuclear stain and FITC phalladoin was a stain specific for actin. So it is a F actin specific stain. It would give you, offer you green color. And what we found is that if you take the molecule, which is shown here, that is a little variant of what I had showed in the past. I mean, there we had tryptophans. In HA2, we have tyrosines, right? What we found is that D tyrosines and L tyrosines are a better half a better half life. So we moved from tryptophan to tyrosines, right? So if you look at the control experiments, the the green fluorescence was not that that exciting. Means the fluoresce this this effectin is being expressed at a certain level in standalone uh, cell culture situation. But as soon as you add our molecule. The process is upregulated. You have more actin, and when the, it binds to FITC phalladoin, and obviously the fluorescence output and the blue dots, if you are able to see them, that is the nucleus, and the rest of the 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 part which is highlighted by the green color is the overexpression of actin, which I just mentioned is a responsible protein for neurite outgrowth. So that was lesson number one taken from the experiment. I won't go into the detail that that actin is definitely getting overexpressed. It is one of the key uh, uh, protein responsible for neurite growth. And possibly that's the reason we are observing neurite growth. We also looked at neurofilaments, right? So neurofilament gene expression is responsible for axon development neuronal regeneration and it has implications in neurodegenerative diseases so if we are upregulating the production of neurofilament proteins both the heavy chains and the light chains there is a possibility that we could use such molecules which release nitric oxide in neurodegenerative diseases so what we did is uh, shown here in the bottom panel, we have a phosphate buffered saline that served as control. And the top panel is our molecule, which was used to stain, uh, which, which was used in the neuro 2 a cell line. And here we had used for, for neurofilament, both heavy and light chains, mouse monoclonal antibodies, which was, you know, which are going to be stained in a way that you get, get the color over propidium iodide, which is red nuclear stain that is shown here. So if you just have propidium iodide, you only have red color because it is staining the nucleus. But now if you have, or, or if you have uh, just the mouse monoclonal antibodies, you get the green color the way it is shown here. But when you merge them, you see that nucleus is stained separate or differently to the green color that is coming from mouse monoclonal antibody, which is staining nucleo, uh, uh, neurofilament heavy and light chain. So what it meant, again, as a very quick take home message that we are also interfering or we are also upregulating the synthesis of, of neurofilament proteins, which are responsible for axonal developments and which have potential in neurodegenerative diseases. The third and final uh, experiment, what we did is with uh, the overexpression of new, uh, a neuronal nuclear antigen that is called new, new N expression. And here we, we challenge ourselves to the, the most difficult situation you can find, right? What we did is that we did not use a negative control. We did not use blank buffer or phosphate buffer saline. Here, what we did is that we directly took a neuronal growth factor. We took neuronal growth factor because these are growth factors are responsible for production of neuronal nuclear antigen. And we wanted to see if we can go head to head with a natural protein, which is de evolutionarily designed to, over, or to, to kickstart or upregulate the synthesis of neuronal nuclear antigen. Can we do the same thing with our molecule? So top panel is our molecule, bottom panel is something which is supremely better compared to our molecule yet, I'm very happy to show you, and one can actually look at this particular picture. You have propidium iodide, which is staining the nucleus. You have new N, uh, a marker, which is, which is shown here. And when you overlay them, 
the bottom panel the bottom right pa rightmost panel is really lit up means new neuronal growth factor is doing its job but what I, we were very happy is that we were not far behind we got about 65 to 75 percent expression that is being achieved by a neuronal growth factor it means we have something in our hand that can go head to head with with normal proteins or required proteins and we can think of substituting some of them in our in vivo assay so again this is a work very very biology oriented uh, but it is already published if some of you wanted to have a look at it right i'm going to move to another uh, uh, gaseous molecule which is uh, hydrogen sulfide and what we have done here is to show you you know uh, uh, how hydrogen sulfide can be synthesized within a cell within a tissue type and eventually be used for a practical purpose or for a biological application again without going into the detail because it's all textbook material you could go from uh, from amino acids the way we had gone from l arginine to synthesize nitric oxide, you can start with cysteine and you can go and synthesize hydrogen sulfide, which can have a number of biological activity. It is, it scavenges reactive oxygen species. It ameliorates a dopaminergic, dopaminergic neuronal de degeneration in Parkinson's disease. And it also helps potentiate the hippocampal system. So a good amount of hydrogen sulfide, especially in neuronal cultures, would be good because it will bring down the, uh, the redox stress and it would maintain the, the sort of homeostatic concentrations of dopamine so that the dopaminergic pathway can work better despite being redox challenge. So what we did here is that uh, I'm not going to show you test tube or in vitro experiment because of paucity of time, directly go to in vivo model. So just assume that we have all the data for in vitro model, which was which is excellent. What we thought is that what if we, we feed our molecule, I'll show you that in a minute, uh, to C. elegans and not just a normal C. elegans. We took a normal wild type C. elegans, but could we take it in a transgenic C. elegans, which is a Parkinson's disease model. So this particular C. elegans has the propensity to show behavior of protein aggregation analogous to Parkinson's disease. So you would use wild type C. elegans, you would use uh, transgenic, uh, transgenic C. elegans, and the reason you would use C. elegans as a model is that unlike billion neurons, which is in our brain, C. elegans only has 300 neurons. So the system is very simple, very simple to work out, very simple to tweak, imagine what is going on or what could be gone wrong or what could go wrong and so that you modify your experiments in such a way. And what essentially you do is, how do you uh, feed a C. elegans your molecule? It is very interesting. Uh, C. elegans uh, eats bacteria, OP50. So if in bacterial culture, if you add your molecule and if it adds, eats the bacteria, then your molecule goes in and it goes all the way wherever you want it to go. And the reactions, once the molecule is eaten, are supposed to release hydrogen sulfide, right? Now, these are the molecules, again, very simple chemical structures idea is not to do complex chemistry idea is to do create new molecules that can do complex biology or solve a problem of contemporary biological interest right so what we have done here is i i particularly point out uh, your attention to conjugates of five and six and to this particular thiolane which is the the essential pharmacophore responsible for generation of hydrogen sulfide. As you would find out, we have taken phenylalanine, we have taken you know, a variety of modified new, uh, amino acids or tryptophan to create a conjugate of these dithiolanes along with our, our dipeptides. And the idea is once you have such a molecule, the liver microsomes or a microsomal preparation eventually releases hydrogen sulfide from such type of structures. And that was the idea. And we were very happy to see that we were able to show synthesis of hydrogen sulfide by LC, uh, LCMS as well as LCMSMS. And that was the high point that not only we synthesize molecules, but we also had C. elegans eat these molecules. You, you, break open C. elegans and the, the 
filtrate that you collect is sped into LCMS. And that's how you, you, you figure out how much H2S is being released over a period of time. And there are other assays available that can help you help you confirm the amount of hydrogen sulfide produced, right? So what I'm going to show, what I'm showing you is, is, is wild type C elegans. But if you, if you can do another type of experiment, what the experiment is to create redox stress inside a C elegans, right? Now, what, what we are doing is that you take bacteria, you take your molecule, and on top of it, you add little bit amount of H2O2. So hydrogen peroxide is exogenously being added to bacterial culture. If you look at this particular trace, the second one is OP50 is bacteria. OP50 plus H2O2 is you are pro providing your C elegans with external oxidative stress so that the amount of oxidative stress can be quantified by fluorescence, which is shown here. So OP50, has some fluorescence. And what you see in this pink pink bar, bar uh, diagram is the amount of extra oxidative stress that you are creating in the system by adding H2O2. Now you add ADTCOH. If I can just go back for a sec, here is ADTCOH and here is the, and rest are the conjugates. Four, five, six are conjugates. And what you find very interestingly is that number five, conjugate number five, which had ditryptophan, really, really, really suppressed redox stress on top of it, whatever is being produced by C elegans after eating OP50. So, H2, so the, our, our hypothesis is that H2S is being synthesized. It is reducing the amount of reactive oxygen species. And that is being reflected in this particular uh, uh, bar chart where you see the, the amount of ROS as determined by fluorescence, uh, uh, fluorescence to be bare minimum compared to any other bar that you see here. So five is your hit compound and five can be taken actually to the transgenic uh, uh, strain. And this particular picture that or, or trace is with wild type, right? This is with wild type. And now we move to uh, NL5901. That is the wild, I mean, that is the transgenic mutant of C. elegans, which is which is mimicking a Parkinson's disease like you know, situation, which is uh, reflected by synthesis of alpha synuclein protein, which is conjugated to a yellow fluorescent protein. So when alpha synuclein is produced, it starts aggregating with a yellow fluorescent protein. You can actually see the growth of this particular protein, the aggregation, and that is why NL5901 is used in our studies with the help of our collaborators in CDRI, Dr. Amir Nazir. He, he took or he helped us uh, prepare this experiment. And what we did is that we, we fed the batch that uh, the, the batch of transgenic C. elegans, the, the material that we have synthesized. And eventually we found that because of the suppression of reactive oxygen species, whatever dopamine was being degraded was not being degraded and by LCMS and LCMSMS, we were able to show the amount that the increase in the concentration of dopamine because you have suppressed the reactive oxygen reactions that were actually degrading uh, uh, dopamine, right? So it is a very dramatic turn of events that you know a simple molecule that was synthesized interferes with the redox pathway or redox suppression and offers you more amount of dopamine. So more amount of dopamine would be reflective in the fact that, you know, you could do better with the Parkinson's disease person, or you can actually design further experiments in animal models, proper animal models, and take this molecule further. And at this moment, we are at that stage that we are going to take this molecule to uh, larger animals. And what I am not showing you here is we do a lot of Western blots and we have figured out which exact protein is being upregulated when you use H2S in transgenic C. elegans because it was becoming too biology. I thought I will uh, let it stay, let this message stay with you that with such simple molecule with H2S, you can maintain the concentrations of dopamine for a long period of time, right? I won't pay, uh, I won't go into the detail in this particular site, but it just came out, this paper came out in chemical science where we have used H2S in a different way, right? Now here, 
we are using synthesis of S2S in cancerous cells, and we have designed such a molecule, which is not only being used for imaging in, of cancer cells, but we are showing how you can induce apoptosis in, in cancerous lesions. And this is a very uh, long paper that we just published in Chemical Science. Very interesting. Here is the, 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 the molecule I wish, I wish that you pay attention. A peptide is involved your fluorophore is involved and a masking molecule is involved, which is the quencher. Once you react it with H2S, the reaction occurs, the mechanism is shown here, and you release the dye, which now lights up cancer cells. And we have done bioenergetics experiment to show how exactly apoptosis would occur. And there's a very curious, very long story. I wish I will have another time to talk to you about it. But let me tell you very quickly, I have 20 minutes left. Uh, that what we have done in stem cell engineering, right? So we know, most of us know that uh, stem cells have fantastic properties, right? They can proliferate and they can differentiate as well. Differentiate is, is important because uh, a lineage of stem cells can give you, you know, specialized tissue type. Proliferation is this simple duplication of stem cells. That is easy. Now, the, the tough question is, that can we think of a small molecule that can have control over differentiation process or control over proliferation process. While we are uh, making an attempt to get in this area with our two papers that are coming out or one has come out, one is about to come out. It, it gives us a, a nice feeling because small molecules, if they could be used for such type of uh, work that, that adds value to our experiment, that adds value to our you know, exploration. And just for our young colleagues, basically uh, what we do is we, we um, harvest a human mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow or, or we, we, we do it from, from umbilical cord. We have the right uh, approvals of ethics committee in my lab, and we ha I have a postdoc who is very good at it. She can harvest stem cells and do do experiments. So all experiments are done by her. So that always helps you to have the right right person in the group who can do something very very nice. So basically, when you start looking at mesenchymal stem cells, you can not only proliferate but you can differentiate into a variety of tissue types. Let us not go into the detail, but more important thing is that it is now known that small molecule modulators can actually promote growth, the proliferation of human pluripotent stem cells. And some of the examples are shown here. This is a paper published in Nature Methods. You may, you may want to look at it. And some of, of these structures are already published and people are working with these molecules for with their interaction with uh, uh, stem cells, right? But what we did is that we thought that we will do something different. Right. So not only we are going to look at stem cells and their interaction with small molecules, but we are going to use a property which is known to us, which is called as biomechanics. Right. So in biomechanics, what we wanted to do was just to see if you are changing the membrane fluidity. And we wanted to do this membrane fluidity experiment with the help of an atomic force microscope. So what, what we wanted is that if a molecule could go inside a stem cell, would it change the fluidity of a membrane? If it could change the fluidity of a membrane, then we have something in our hand that could be used to study stem cell biomechanics in detail. Right, so we we chose nano indentation as our experiment, and if you lay down cell so cells on a surface, for example, stem cells, and you come in with a cantilever, what you do is that you take cantilever, you make an impression on on, on the cells, and you see how long it takes or how much force it takes to make a depression, and how long it takes for that depression to come back to its original shape once you have removed the cantilever. So the stress versus relaxation time or strain versus relaxation time, that all is possible if you use the right, can right cantilever and you use the right mathematical expression, which is here, that is coming from Hertz model. So you use Hertz model, you use the right cantilever, an atomic force microscope, liquid uh, microscopy, uh, uh, liquid phase imaging, all that is again being done in my laboratory. So you could use the, the, this, this particular uh, uh, equation 
to determine stress versus strain constant, you can actually calculate uh, uh, the, uh, the Young's modulus, right? So what this picture is very important. What we synthesize is a very simple peptide, cysteine, alanine, glycine. That is the molecule. We synthesize both the L type and the D, D series. So LCAG and DCAG. And we did what is force mapping of human mesenchymal stem cells. So HMSC, which is written here, that stands for, 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 for human mesenchymal stem cells. And what you eventually found that you could make an impression on these cells under, under uh, uh, liquid. And once the indentation is made, which is red in color, the retraction of that indentation, you would see almost like a hysteresis, right? We all know the, the, the hysteresis curves. So you go in one direction, then it comes back and you would find that it does come back with certain amount of changes in the structure. That's okay. But what I wanted to, to uh, draw your attention to is that once we, once we started adding our molecule, right? the tripeptide, what we found is that we could increase the Young's modulus 2.5 times. Though there was change in Young's modulus, stress versus strain by addition of this simple tripeptide and interrogating or probing stem cells by nano indentation so that you can do a, a, a biomechanic studies. So what are the applications? Numerous applications are possible. I'm going to show you something very simple. So immunological applications, mechanical applications, you could use exogenous stem cells and you can take these biophysical measurements and you could use the knowledge gain to design the right kind of molecules for tissue regeneration. That is possible and we are doing it, right? So uh, this is a very simple experiment published uh, a, a year before last in ChemCom that we, uh, we took stem cells, human mesenchymal stem cells, and this, this arrow is a wound, right? We are creating a wound. We are putting some stem cells. We are letting it grow for a while. And you remove this arrow. You remove the wound. Once you remove the wound, what you find is a lot of empty space is remaining. Now this empty space represents that something has happened if there is a wound or if you have removed the insert. Now to fill that empty space in a given period of time, the proliferation has to happen and proliferation has to happen at a certain pace. Now, can you accelerate or decelerate that is in your hand through small molecules? And, and that is what we are going to study in, and, and the picture is shown here, right? So these yellow lines represent the wound, wound size with stem cells shown here. Right, and the peptides that are being added. I would not go into the detail. I urge you to read the paper if it interests you. What I am showing you is that it was possible for us to accelerate the healing of wound cell, and where this particular compart, this particular panel, we only use buffer. When you only use buffer, the the proliferation is at their own pace. But if you add the peptide, it, it really went quick, it was fast. So it means that you have the ability to engineer stem cells for their growth and you could possibly use them in regenerative medicine. And right now we are far ahead. We are using these stem cells, use, using a small molecule for, for angiogenesis uh, experiments where we are forcing it to you know, uh, make blood cells faster. And, and that is our, our uh, work which is not published yet because there were some intellectual properties involved. So we wanted to be ultra sure before we send it out for publication. And we have done again, a lot of Western blots. I won't go into the detail just to show you that when we do these experiments, every hypothesis is confirmed by protein overexpressions, which proteins are being overexpressed. Even when you add as simple an organic molecule as a tripeptide, cysteine, alanine, glycine tripeptide. So students in my group would have to learn everything. You make the molecule, you harvest the stem cells, you, you do the biomechanics, you take it to cell culture, you do Western blots along with the postdoc, but that helps you learn all these techniques and, and that's very important. And we are far ahead in this uh, uh, study with our uh, new set of molecules. So finally, in in maybe five minutes, even at the cost of going too fast, I'm going to wind up the material science aspect of peptides, which is applied coloration. And what I'm showing you right now is, you know, a, a riot of colors, if you will, right? A chameleon or a, a peacock feather, 
you look at these beautiful colors, you think, oh my God, where they have come from. So there are numerous, numerous ways you can generate these colors uh, in natural systems. I won't go into the detail, but these are colloidal assemblies of polymeric particles very, or opal-based systems, metal, metal nanoparticles, metal oxides, anything that can absorb light and offer you a, a palette of colors could be used to mimic uh, uh, an artificial or uh, a uh, natural system. So what we did is that we did something, uh, uh, we did not design this experiment. I would like to be very honest. This just happened. The student did the experiment and we were, we found something magical happened. And what was this, uh, this particular tri of a pentapeptide gave us elliptical structures under microscope. And this student could quickly realized that if it is so elliptical and so it's possible for us to put it in a line, the way you have shown here, we have shown here, we have created lines by creating creases on a surface. Then if, let it in, if we let it interact with uh, light, we should see colors by, by refraction or if by just by scattering, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. What you, what you will uh, appreciate here is that there is no chromophore here. I mean, real chromophore that can offer you light, right? Or, or color means you can absorb UV, but phenyl island, the, the phenyl ring would not offer you something, uh, some great color. So whatever color we will see in future slides is coming as a structural color. The molecule itself is not colored, but because it is arranged in a certain way, we were able to show that you can generate a, a almost a rainbow like coloration, which is shown here by putting the light in a different incident angle, right? If you put it at a different, different incident angle, either through transmission or reflectance, you could, oops, sorry, you could actually do a lot of interesting things here. And what one can do is that you can not only see colors, you can actually write. So it's a dip pen uh, type of writing. And at 10 millimeter scale, what you see is written IATK. And because we were not having the right kind of equipment and expertise to probe it further, one of my very close collaborator, Ehud Gazit from uh, Tel Aviv University, they participated in this work with equal footing and they wrote TAU. Tel Aviv University. So under transmission, as well as reflectance, we were able to show the color. And most important thing was not only color, but we found the right solvent where you can actually create such bubbles as it is shown in the panel D, right? A bigger bubble, which contains smaller spheres. And that was the genesis of color. The chromaticity diagram is here. Let's not worry about it. But more important to realize is that synthesis of this rainbow-like color palette from a pentapeptide, which has no chromophore of its own, just sheer, sheer size, I mean, sheer morphology is able to give us the color. And we ascribed this property to me scattering, which is somewhat you know, sort of orthogonal to Rayleigh scattering where you would have electromagnetic radiation interact with a, you know, ellipse or ellipsoid like uh, soft structure. And the scattering would be such that it would lead to uh, uh, some kind of directionality of scattering. You would get color synthesis and that is reflected in our pentapeptide, which I've just shown you. So I already talked to you about, you know, bigger bubble having smaller pictures. So we did a lot of studies of these non-ordered spheres and we found out that we are onto something and we have the right kind of solvent system, right peptide to generate whatever color we want. And, and we are going to make more peptides, bring out the structural color aspect in greater detail so that in further work we can use or we can invoke me scattering to generate different synthesize colors. We can use it for bottom up or large scale cell printing. So you can think of, you know, uh, uh, bigger surfaces being painted by this peptide and the color, the topology control would come from using different solvents. So it's a pentapeptide with phenylalanine, right? You must have seen. So hydrophobic peptide with having a, a slightly hydrophilic solvent or otherwise vice versa would eventually give you modifications of color and hydrophobicity can be tuned as well. You can use say tyrosine, for example, if you want a little bit of hydrophilicity and eventually we would like to put adhesive so that this color can actually stick to a surface.
right? You can paint a surface, not get it washed off. And eventually that would offer you greater resilience if you are painting a, a glass or you're painting a car surface. For example, if you paint a car and if your car moves and takes a left turn, the light, incident light is always going to be different and your car will not have a unique color. It will have multiple colors, you know, uh, uh, visible when, when things move out. And of course, applications in 3D printing are also up under Anvil. And a lot of work goes on in the lab in variety of uh, uh, disciplines or sub-disciplines. I cannot talk about everything. So we work on bioanalytical detection, new antibiotics, which is extremely close to our heart. And we just published a ACS chemical biology review on new antibiotics, which we have been working on. on uh, we, have, uh, we work on amyloid modulation. Now we are taking it from uh, C. elegans to animal models. And we also work on functional models and computational, uh, functional materials and computational model and uh, modeling with conducting materials. I talked to you about supercapacitors. We do a lot of theoretical modeling and we work on interfacial systems uh, where we use uh, the kind of work I just demonstrated to you, right? Uh, applied coloration at system, at, at surfaces where you can generate a, a lot of interesting applications. So with these, uh, very quick overview at the cost of going a bit too fast because it's a you know roundup of what we do. I wish to thank uh, the chair, Professor Uma, for uh, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, Sastra CNRO Award Jury and all listeners who have tuned in to listen to me this afternoon. Thank you so very much. Back to you, Professor Uma. Thank you, Professor Verma. It was raining a lot of information. And there are uh, also a few questions that have uh, already been posted. So I've uh, picked it up from the YouTube link. Uh, so uh, we will, we have about four minutes. So I would uh, go with the questions. Uh, so most of these have actually been triggered from your nitric oxide part of the talk. As, uh, as nitric oxide can be neuroprotective as well as neurotoxic. How to regulate its release from compound one? So by compound one, I believe the listener wants to know about the HA2 that you had been discussing. So uh, that's a great question because I said that uh, the possibility is of, uh, I mean, you have both possibilities, neuroprotection and neurotoxicity. So the idea here is that we fine tune the concentration we fine tune the side chains that are responsible, say dipeptide or different combinations of dipeptide, or even we have tested tripeptides, which will allow you to generate nitric oxide at a particular pace, right? That is the rate of synthesis as well as concentration. So it is entirely possible, but it requires quite a bit of synthetic, it is a synthetic challenge not in terms of complexity of synthesis, but you have to synthesize quite a number of derivatives to ensure that you have the right conjugate, which gives you concentrations that are tolerant, tolerant or that are you know, not cytotoxic or neurotoxic, but it is indeed possible. We have done it, yeah. Thank you. So Thank there you. is a follow-up question. Uh, release of nitric oxide will also depend on endogenous glutathione which may be different in healthy versus disease condition. And also there may be differences among individuals. Can we design molecules that can release nitric oxide based on differences in glutathione levels or the level of nitric oxide required by an individual? That's an excellent question where the uh, listener is taking us to personalize medicine path, right? So it's a very lofty goal if I can add here, what, what, uh, they have posed is a very important question, but at the moment we are more working. We, I mean, it, it can be done or it cannot be done that I cannot tell you right away. But what I know is that it is possible to regulate the delivery of nitric oxide, right? So if we, are, we have been able to do it in C. elegans. We have been able to do it in neuronal cell culture. So when, it, when you increase the complexity of the system by taking it to an individual, it remains to be seen, as they correctly point out, the amount of available glutathione will play a critical role, 
right so that all has to be worked out we have not worked it out as yet we are just optimizing our design taking it one step at a time to in vivo system so that our the 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 principles of synthesis the principle of uh, no generation and the whole protocol can be understood a bit better but what you ask is much into the future we will keep that in mind thank you thank you uh, there are a, a couple of more questions which i can squeeze in um, this is i think uh, something with your c elegance model uh, dietary protein restriction is also found to benefit from oxidative stress aging and ros production in drosophila models the fruit fly models how do you take this in parallel with your results to improve the individual's health so again uh, it's a great question we this is much into the future right now we are uh, the way research goes as you would appreciate we are still at c elegance level of course it is not uh, uh, i mean we have not used the fruit fly as a model as yet so we have been working only with c elegance but when time comes and we have the right collaboration we would like to explore some of these problems that are being articulated in drosophila as well thank you uh so uh the peptide structures that you had talked about uh so they are capable of self assembly so does the nature of the self assembly structure form have any influence on the release or the interactions of these nitric oxide or h2s releasing molecules indeed yes uh, i had mentioned that we synthesize close to 25 derivatives okay. and the right combination occurred only when we used ditryptophan that gave us uh, a, a half life of about 30 hours which we were able to enhance by d d amino acids to almost 48 hours so you don't want anything more than you know two days in your system so i think we are at the right uh, sort of combination to be used for such type of study and but it is possible to degrade it faster or longer based on the design that you prefer thank you yeah and a follow up question on that does the peptide conjugate cross the blood brain barrier uh see right now we we have not done that i say we have just seen or shown that it can directly go inside uh, say an animal model which is say c elegans or an in vivo model c elegans but blood brain barrier specifically is not done but what we would eventually like to do is take it into a mice model then the role of blood brain barrier very you know would would come out in open and hopefully we'll report in future that's a great question again very nice thank you and i i hope i was squeezed in this one additional question on the last part uh, are the color changing peptides inspired by some materials in biological systems if so can you please give the analogy from which this inspiration was taken so uh, as i said this was not designed so this particular work came out of uh, nowhere because we were actually looking at i did not pay too much attention i mean too much time on it uh, we took that pentapeptide fragment from malarial apical antigen it is actually a protein found in malaria parasite we were working on that uh, particular pentapeptide for something else totally different reason uh that we synthesize this particular pentapeptide this is very simple flpl lf right i mean very simple peptide but we were just surprised that it gave us the result that we obtained but at the moment i cannot refer to you uh to any paper where only peptide or peptides alone would give you color very few reports available so natural inspiration will not really happen here because most of the time we find that it is interspersed with uh, metallic systems which can you know absorb color and release color but pure protein a pure shorter peptide offering you a palette of rainbow colors that is very unique and but it is being done but so but we cannot i cannot offer you an example of systems where actually it is going to be a uh, used or it has been taken from inspiration taken from yeah i think that serendipity has opened up completely new exactly. avenues yeah. i think <laughs> right so uh, i think uh, we are 5 minutes over time but nevertheless it has been a great session and you have triggered so many thoughts i'm sure the youngsters who have been there listening are already thinking of new dimensions to work on especially on this very interesting field 
some of those molecules are so simple, you know, that uh, it could be easily done in the laboratory and uh, there, there are multiple applications. So thank you very much, Professor Verma. I think uh, through embodiment of the Science Day, uh, you had actually shown how, uh, how intelligent design of molecules, simple molecules can actually be used in a wide dimension of applications. And you have touched upon the interface with biology, but I know that your group also works on batteries and uh, other interesting things. We will look forward to another topic or uh, talk on that aspect also. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sir, now live. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, Professor Govind Raja, shall we start? Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Sastra University, I, Dr. Devraj, Associate Professor of Chemistry, welcome you all for the final lecture of National Science Day lecture series. Uh, I take immense pleasure in introducing Professor Govind Raju. Uh, who is uh, one of the winners of Sastra CNR Award. Uh, he obtained his PhD in the year 2005 from National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. Then he moved to US for his first postdoctorate. Uh, from there, he moved to Max Planck Institute of Molecular Physiology as a Humboldt Fellow. Uh, after his postdoctoral stint at a couple of countries, he joined JNCSR as a faculty. Uh, where he's, he has done an outstanding work, which he has reflected in many awards and honors. I'm not going to list all of them for, uh, since I don't want to take away his uh, technical lecture time, right? I, I shall list only very few of them. Uh, Professor Govind Raju published more than 180 papers and he has 37 patents to his credit. To cite some of the awards and honors he received, uh, uh, some of the most important ones, not in a chronological order, uh, CRSI bronze medal in the year 2016 from the Chemical Research Society of India, Young Scientist Award in the year 2017 from Indian Peptide Society, uh, Professor CNR Award in the year 2015 from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. So in the name of Professor CNR Rao, uh, the, the giant of chemistry in India, he is receiving the third award today, uh, CRDA Award for Excellence in Drug Research from uh, Central Drug Research Institute. He was also receive, uh, recipient of Swarna Jayanti Fellowship in the year 2016. And in the last year, he was awarded Shanti Swarna Badnakar Award. So these are some of the awards and honors uh, he received. Uh, he is also a fellow of many societies. To cite one, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So with this very brief introduction about Professor Govind Raju, I invite him to deliver his lecture titled Pathophysiology, Diagnostic and Therapeutic Modalities. Uh, Professor Govind Raju, please. Uh, can you see my slide? Uh, yes, it is visible. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Devraj, for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, this okay. Thanks to uh, Shastra University for, for this opportunity to share uh, some of our work uh, on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, today, particularly, I'm going to uh, talk to you uh, about current status, uh, our, understand, our understanding of uh, disease mechanisms, diagnostic and therapeutic modalities for this uh, disease, Alzheimer's uh, disease. And possibly, I will also, you know, give uh, what holds good for, you know, in the near future for this uh, disease. Before that, again, I would like to thank uh, Shastra uh, University for conferring the Shastra CNR Award, uh, which is named after the living legend, Professor CNR Rao. Uh, indeed, a great honor and privilege uh, for me to uh, receive this uh, award today. And of course, today we are uh, celebrating National Science Day. Uh, well, you have already well versed with the event, 
and you have heard many things about it. I'm not going to uh, uh, deep dive into the topic or uh, about National Science Day. All I would like to mention that on this day, C.V. Raman announced the discovery of the Raman effect. When it was announced, it was just uh, one of the you know phenomena discovered. But I am sure you know you all aware now that Raman effect has been exploited in you know number of you know you know, te- you know technologies or even you know number of uh, applications across several uh, you know domains. What is more interesting also from the government of uh, India, uh, you know the honourable minister, you know you know along with the you know different departments uh, announced uh, the theme for this year's uh, uh, National Science Day celebration. We have Professor Sandeep Verma from uh, SCRB uh, with us. That is integrated approach in science and technology for sustainable future to raise uh, scientific uh, awareness. This also a theme based, you know, it also recommends theme based approach for problem solving and science communication activities. Well, you know, personally, it is such a a yeah, beautiful theme. Uh, I believe you know it's going to change the mindset of both practicing scientists and uh, budding uh, or a budding scientists or you know or somebody you know the like students who are you know with us today uh, who are you know thinking about you know practicing you know to take up science uh, and on a bigger picture this is going to change the landscape of our developments uh, uh, in our country. Let me take 30 seconds or so to tell you what are the ongoing projects uh, in our laboratory. Uh, this is particularly, I'm you know, kind of going to spend 30 seconds uh, considering the, you know, the research, uh, strong research interest, uh, you know, our strong research projects, ongoing projects at Shastra University. So we work in the area of bioorganic chemistry and chemical biology, uh, particularly interested in proteins. And uh, proteins, when I say proteins, protein-based materials under the theme of functional and disease amyloid. When I say functional amyloid, there are protein-based materials which are beneficial. One of the best example I would take, uh, I would give you is silk. So silk is a protein-based material and we are working on silk and its biomimetics for biomaterial application. And in the process, we also, you know, kind of establish a reductionistic approach. We termed as a, a new concept, molecular architectonics. We have done a quite a bit of work in this area, which is, although it's not, uh, you know, kind of a part of today's talk. But as I mentioned, I did, I would, I wanted to mention this because there is a strong research uh, interest uh, in this domain at uh, Shastra University. Coming to when the proteins or protein-based material uh, become toxic, especially in the brain, we call them disease amyloids. Of course, these disease amyloids are responsible for many, many uh, diseases. We call them neurodegenerative diseases. And we are particularly interested in you know, Alzheimer's disease uh, you know, for understanding the disease mechanisms, as well as the developing diagnostic and therapeutic tools uh, for this uh, disease. That's what I'm going to talk to you uh, today. Let me start with dementia. I hope uh, all of you are, you know, some of you must have heard of uh, dementia. So dementia is an umbrella term uh, used, uh, you know, for, you know, kind of a refer to, 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 to kind of a mental uh, illness condition, mental uh, illness, which is severe enough to interfere with our daily life. Okay. Having said that, uh, dementia, you know, is a, you know, it's interfere with our daily life in terms of, you know, memory and thinking, but it's itself is not a specific disease. Rather, an umbrella, this, you know, term, dementia is an umbrella term, which comprises of many, many diseases. So together, many of them are, you know, you know, collectively termed as neurodegenerative diseases, and particularly Alzheimer disease. Alzheimer disease, uh, const- you know. Uh, contributes to 60 to 80 percent of all dementia. So please do remember that while there are many diseases, only few are mentioned here. Among all of them, Alzheimer's is the major contributor towards uh, dementia. And of course, if you ask me as a student, if you ask me to explain what is dementia in one or two words, I would say losing everything what you know or what we know. Okay. So that is dementia. And there is also another condition, which is not too different. We call it as mixed dementia, which is wherein more than one or you know, more than one type of these neurodegenerative you know, diseases coexist. 
Okay, for example, for instance, Alzheimer disease can coexist with Parkinson disease. In fact, that is specifically termed as Parkinson plus. Okay, that's the, any neurodegenerative disease condition is already a difficult, but when they you know coexist, it becomes even more difficult. So that's what we call mixed dementia. Probably I will refer to that uh, it later uh, in my in, in my talk. Having said that, you know, having uh, used the term neurodegenerative diseases, let me explain that by taking you, you know, back to possibly what we have studied in our 12th standard textbooks. Okay, we are aware that proteins are produced on ribosomes. So ribosomes are the you know factories for producing proteins as a polypeptide chains. Okay, they are you know proteins are produced as polypeptide chains on the ribosomes. And these polypeptide chains are subjected to protein folding, what is what we call protein folding, such that they take their three-dimensional structure and become functional. Sometimes these functional proteins are a enzyme, for instance, enzymes are their processed products, usually peptides, uh, undergo misfolding, and these misfolding proteins are very toxic to the cells. Of course, cells do have repair mechanism, wherein the cells can recycle or put back this misfolded protein back into repair uh, uh, mechanism, or if that's not possible, it will be degraded by, uh, for example, proteosomal uh, degradation, autophagy, or, few, uh, you know, or some other uh, related uh, mechanism. Under some uh, adverse physiological conditions, these misfolded proteins and peptides undergo amyloidogenic or become amyloidogenic, meaning they undergo order degradation you know, they collapse to the, the, the most stable or a thermodynamically stable state and undergo aggregation to produce materials, particularly in the brain, and which is responsible for more than 25 different neurodegenerative diseases. Well, Alzheimer's is one such disease. In fact, a major disease, as I already mentioned, it constitutes around 60 to 80 percent of all uh, dementia. And the disease itself was identified more than 100 years ago by a doctor known as Alois Alzheimer, who was a physician doctor uh, in, in Germany while treating the patient Augusta Dieter. And after her death, so, so you know, in our 50s, after her death, her brain, autopsy of her brain revealed presence of two kinds of protein aggregates. One is called flocks, another one is called tangles. I'll come to that, uh, what is this flocks and tangles. So unfortunately, although disease has been identified more than 100 years ago, still there are no fully approved diagnoses and definitely there are no proper tools for this disease. Even more, you know, even more uh, worrisome is that while all the major diseases are showing decline, see when I say decline, there is a biomedical uh, you know, improve, you know, developments related to this disease, both in terms of detection as well as possibility of curing. That's why number of deaths have come down relatively. But in case of Alzheimer's disease, this number of diseases, you know, a number of uh, deaths have gone up by 71%. This is a world data as of 2013, as I speak now. So it, this number has gone up by more than 100%. Well, some years ago, when in, for, for instance, when I started my research, the Alzheimer's disease was considered as a disease of Western countries. Uh, but this is mainly because the mental health was you know, largely neglected. That is changing uh, in India. Even its public is very well aware of Alzheimer's disease or in dementia uh, in general. And particularly, there is a you know, life change in lifestyle and many other stuff. And that is going to contribute. There is a going to be huge increase in number of cases uh, from Asia, uh, particularly uh, in India. Of course, that will definitely affect uh, you know, public health and yeah, economy, and we need to do something for this chronic uh, disease. The disease symptoms of Alzheimer's disease uh, includes mainly cognitive de deterioration, the triplex in memory loss, the also affected, uh, you know, also affects domains of language, skilled movements, recognition, decision making, and planning. Let me take a one uh, case study and demonstrate to you how you know, severe, uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease is. What you see here is a cell portrait of an artist, uh, you know, art an American artist who lived in uh, UK. His name is William Utumolan. This is its uh, cell portrait in 1930s. Uh, when he was in, in not in, not, I'm sorry about it. So when he was in 30s, 
that is in 1967. Subsequently, in 1995, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And this person was, you know, very uh, brave, and he wanted to know how it feels like uh, to live with Alzheimer Alzheimer's disease, and also possibly he wanted to show the world how it feels like to, you know, to have Alzheimer uh, disease. And he started making his self portrait after uh, his diagnosis. And you can clearly see that disease in 1996, 97, 98, and in next few years, he lost himself. If you remember how to describe uh, dementia, I told you losing everything, what you know, the patient knows what we know, right? See, precisely that is what is happening here. So in next few years, all you can remember or you can you know, recognize is a skull, nothing else here, okay? And of course, he subsequently uh, uh, dies. And that's how severe Alzheimer's disease. And uh, particularly from an Indian point of view, we always tend to equate uh, a dementia with aging. Okay, if somebody has a you know mental illness or a dementia, we always say that okay, it's something to do with a, you know dementia. And even we don't even bother. Of course, it, that is things are changing, but definitely the mental uh, you know health was not so much, or a dementia was not considered so seriously uh, until recently. But let me tell you that aging and dementia or Alzheimer's disease is very different and Alzheimer's is a true disease and aging is not. See, for example, if you take a memory deficit, the green trace, what you see is the normal aging, okay? The memo, you know, memory will never falls to zero or a baseline. But in case of a dementia or a Alzheimer's case, where the patient will be you know, uh, uh, diagnosed mostly by behavioral changes, by then the disease condition is already in the advanced stage. And from there, memory takes a free fall. You can clearly see this. So I hope it's clear to you that dementia is a, you know, it's a true disease and it is not part of normal aging. And what we know now is that from, you know, from an extended, you know, kind of, uh, you know, large amount of data, you know, and data and the research, we also know that the disease, the symptoms actually, you know, starts probably a one or two decades before uh, the diagnosis that happens by behavioral uh, changes. And in fact, if you uh, have to interfere with the disease, both in terms of detection as well as diagnosis, I think we need to work somewhere uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 in this, you know, probably 10 to uh, 20 years early uh, than what is our age age of detection. Coming to molecular mechanisms, so there is a transmembrane protein called amyloid precursor protein, and this protein can be cleaved by a group, a family of enzymes, uh, proteases called secretases, particularly cleavage involving beta and gamma secretase generate this short peptide of anywhere from 37 to 43 amino acids, and particularly an amino acid with 42 amino acids is very sticky. We call it as amyloid beta peptides. And when I say sticky, it undergo aggregation through beta sheet formation, of course, also supported by many other non-covalent interactions to form polymorphic aggregation species, which include oligomers, photofibrils, and also fibrils. And this process will be accelerated by the presence of redox metals such as copper and iron uh, to produce, again, this complex uh, polymorphic species, but these species also become machine, become machine for generating you know, lots of reactive oxygen species. I hope you all heard earlier talk by Professor Sandeep Verma, uh, you know, about the reactive oxygen species. I'll also talk about some aspect of uh, these reactive oxygen species they are, as they are very, very important, both physiologically as well as pathologically. Through, so this, uh, this process, we call it as amyloid burden, and that leads to oxidative stress and inflammation, which, through unknown route or unknown mechanism, not unknown route to unknown, which is not well understood, leads to hyperphosphorylation of another protein called tau, which is a microtubule binding protein responsible for the stability of the microtubules and hyperphosphorylation collapse, leads to collapse of the tau protein, of course, collapse of the microtubule and the tau protein itself undergo aggregation to form what we call neurofibrillary tangles or simply we can call them tangles. If you remember the patient's Autopsy of the patient brain revealed two kinds of protein aggregates. One is plaques and tangles. The plaques are these amyloid uh, you know, you know, aggregation species. 
and the tangles are aggregation species of tau. Together, they lead to multiple toxicities. And now you can clearly see that Alzheimer disease is not a you know, linear uh, disease, rather a multifactorial uh, disease. And uh, once again, I would like to reiterate the fact that Alzheimer's disease is not a, a true, uh, you know, is not a part of aging, rather it's a true disease. And uh, recently, so I, as I mentioned in terms of diagnosis, so the mostly the diagnosis is mostly done, uh, you know, by uh, looking at the patient behavioral changes. So, but that is already an advanced stage, wherein, you know, it's like a point of no return. So recently National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer uh, Association came up with a research framework. It's precisely in 2018, the report was published in 2018. And this research framework suggests that we use definite biomarkers such as amyloid beta, the peptide, and I told you, tau and their aggregation and related neurodegeneration as a specific biomarkers. And these biomarkers has to be used for diagnosis of Alzheimer disease. In addition, the framework also left open-ended so that as and when if somebody come, you know, identify and validates the new biomarkers that can be added into this list as well. Okay, so I'll come back to this, you know, particular point later, a uh, little later, uh, or anyway. So once again, so now you all must be, particularly students, you all must be wondering why there are no fully approved diagnosis or, you know, drugs for Alzheimer's disease. That is mainly because as I already mentioned, there is a multi you know, faceted toxicity in case of Alzheimer disease, the involving polymorphic species of two kinds of protein aggregates and their malfunctioning in the clearance. And these species can also cause membrane toxicity. I'll talk about that later. And reactive oxygen species, these plays a very, very important role in terms of causing oxidative stress, inflammation. They also bring in about mitochondrial dysfunction, they damage biomolecules, which can be DNA, protein, or lipid. And also there is a synoptic toxicity uh, and many other such toxicities involved. So that makes the disease multifactorial disease. In the, otherwise, there are multiple biomarkers and targets for this disease. But so far, the efforts both in academia and industry has been mostly targeted at individual biomarker array. Uh, targets. So we believe such an approach will not lead to fruitful outcome. Outcome. So for that, uh, you know, you know, in that context, we are working on, you know, developing multi, you know, pronged strategies or a multi, you know, developing multifunctional tools for both diagnostic and therapeutic, wherein we can target more than one uh, biomarker or a disease target. So if you want to know more about Alzheimer's disease. So here is a comprehensive book which I have edited, and you know it came out uh, a few weeks ago, which talks about you know it's a really come you know 700 page uh, book which talks about disease mechanism, diagnostic, and therapeutic modalities. Possibly, if you are interested, you can take a look into this book. Now coming to amyloid toxicity, or I talk you know I talked about protein aggregation and their toxicity. How it feels like. Can we see that, you know, how actually this amyloid toxicity looks like? Well, we can, possibly. So we can, looking at the health of the cells, you can actually, talk, you know, kind of, you know, make out whether there is a toxicity or not. And we use this term, you know, the biologists will understand cell viability by that is basically looking at the cell, how healthy is the cell uh, uh, under these conditions. So what you see is here, the cells, neuronal cells, you know, you have to take my word, and these are healthy cells. This is a atomic force microscopy image wherein we use bio AFM, an integrated AFM and confocal microscopy. Again, thanks to uh, uh, my Sorna Jayanti Fellowship and uh, DST and SP SCRP for the funding. And you can clearly see these are the healthy cells. And when these healthy cells are incubated with amyloid, uh, you know, protein aggregates, and you can see that they bring about this, what we call amyloid toxicity, wherein these cells develop, you know, are the form extensive network of stress fibers. I hope you can see the insect, the aromar, they're all the stress fibers. The cells are under, you know, uh, really, you know, under, a, you know, you know uh, stress, meaning cells can actually develop, the stress fiber can develop uh, normal, you know, under, many, you, know, you know, normal conditions as well. 
but what you see is is a extensive the network network of stress uh, fibers that is because of the amyloid or amyloid induced uh, stress and these cells subsequently undergo neurodegeneration meaning these cells will subsequently del, uh, die or you know what we call apoptosis so you all aware that in the in the in the, in the brain we have billions of uh, neurons and these billions of neurons connected through trillions of connections so that is what we call neuronal circuit or neuronal network and sometimes generally we also call wiring okay you all must have you know if you are not from a chemistry or a biology or if you have like a computer science and things like that so you may have also heard you know wiring in the brain so this particular wiring or neuronal circuit network that is you know precisely what is required for learning memory or in general our cognitive functions when the cells die these networks are actually disrupted and that subsequently leads leads to what we you know disabilities in terms of learning uh, memory uh, or cognitive functions in general and many other uh, toxicity so what all we need to do here is to detect these conditions and possibly develop tools to rescue them and you know bring back these affected cells uh, to healthy state instead of you know pushing them to neurodegeneration or a cell death i also talked about reactive oxygen species well these tiny species believe me as i already told you you heard already you know another aspect of such story from professor sandeep verma these tiny species are very very interesting they are very important for our physiological conditions however if they cross a threshold concentration they become dreaded villain okay when i say dreaded villain i really mean it mean it mean it because you must have seen a villain seen a movie or you can imagine but nobody is is can be you know can be so dreaded as this tiny species here we have oxygen which trans you know undergo reduction to water through pore electron reduction system producing superoxide hydrogen peroxide and hydroxy radicals and hydrogen peroxide is relatively longer species this can be converted into hypochlorous uh, acid and you know by the by it is catalyzed by myeloperoxidase and again hypochlorous acid is also very very important uh, uh, you know physiologically and also under physiological conditions and this is so important uh, you know this is particularly very important uh, in the time we are living now we talked about corona pandemic and we are living with this uh, for last uh, couple of uh, years and uh, if everybody you know whether they understood or not we talk about immunity so if you are talking about somebody has a good immunity believe me this hocl is produced and this is the one which actually nullify pathogens like bacteria and viruses uh, you know viruses and in fact i hope you must have heard also a trump controversy in the very beginning of uh, uh, of uh, 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 corona pandemic and he said bleach can be in you know can be a very you know bleach can also you know cure you know can kill viruses well he was actually uh, you know you know criticized uh, extensively but he was not actually uh, wrong you know fully wrong it's just that he didn't put it you know properly so bleach is actually sodium you know so you know sodium or you know calcium salt of uh, hypochlorous uh, acid and if this hypochlorous acid produced internally it is good for us because it can kill hypochlorous you know the bacteria and if however we cannot consume externally the bleach uh, sorry bleach okay so that's what it is so as long as they are under threshold concentrations they are very good for us they are friend but under alzheimer condition there is an enzyme this particular over expression of myeloperoxidase and that leads to over expression of uh, hypochlorous acid there is also a loop mechanism over expression of all other reactive oxygen species that also triggers you know production of other uh, kind of reactive oxygen in you know, a reactive species that is reactive nitrogen species all of which leads to oxidative stress inflammation biomolecule damage and together they aggravate the alzheimer disease uh, conditions so coming to uh, uh, detection as i already mentioned there are no fully approved detection for uh, alzheimer disease a again again this part i will quickly you know move on so some years ago we have developed a molecular probe uh, which is a small molecules uh, we and also we rarely come across small molecules with uh, sensitivity as good as antibody uh, antibody sensitivity and selectivity as good as antibody so here we have developed a one small molecules a near infrared probe 
which is uh, which, which exhibit sensitivity and selectivity to the some of the tar you know biomarker particularly amyloid plaques in case of alzheimer disease uh, you know same sensitivity yeah, and selectivity as uh, uh, antibodies not only that this you know the, the data what you see is actually a brain data brain samples from alzheimer patients of course is an ex vivo uh, samples and here our detailed study revealed that our probe not only can detect alzheimer disease it can also differentiate alzheimer disease from other neurodegenerative uh, diseases this is particularly important if you remember i mentioned about mixed dementia when somebody has a dementia more often it can be a mixed dementia unless you know the what is what you know what kind of uh, diseases you know patient is suffering from so for you know we will not be able to devise uh, uh, treatment options so here we have a unique tool molecular tool and method to not only detect alzheimer disease but also distinguish alzheimer uh, disease of course uh, we have developed uh, positive of time i will not go into the details so we do have now uh, you know develop uh, um, you know establish mice models uh, in our laboratory at jnc asr wherein we can you know study some of our tools and you know, our molecules uh, both for diagnostic and therapeutics and which can be later taken forward for you know if there is a you know a good uh, you know if you find them uh, lead candidates uh, so we can take it forward for uh, human trials so this is the mice model and the the candidate small, small molecules which i mentioned in fact crosses blood brain uh, barrier and you can clearly see that this is the data from wild type mice that is healthy mice you hardly see any you know kind of uh, protein aggregates here but this is the ad phenotypic mice the mice which actually develops ad conditions in the brain and you see that you know in the right side here cq that is our pro what i would like to draw your attention is the cleanness of the data what you see here very very clean uh, compared to some other probe which is available in the market which is known to be non you know non selective and our probe not only crosses blood brain barrier and it selectively you know beautifully without any background uh, you know stains these protein aggregates of course uh, so we are now is you know you know it has a real you know in, you know kind of lot of implications for alzheimer disease and we also developed few other uh, molecular probes i am not showing all of it here uh, particularly for uh, tracking reactive oxygen species and one small piece of data what you see right here is the image it is one of the most important image which is showing that the multifaceted toxicity which i refer to so you see different colors the red color is, is is corresponding to protein aggregates and the green color what you see is reactive oxygen species what is important here is these reactive oxygen species are produced and proximally localized with these protein aggregates so meaning there is also oxidative stress and neuroinflammation in a way it is showing you a multi you know see you know kind of a complexity of the disease and uh, uh, and in addition to that we also in a way we also identified and validated a combination my biomarker meaning the protein in the reactive oxygen species co-localized with these protein aggregates and we believe this can be now added into the national institute of aging and alzheimer association uh, research framework uh, of 2018 which i uh, mentioned uh, earlier uh, for a for a reliable uh, detection of alzheimer disease of course uh, we also propose we also propose multimodal and uh, this data this particular work also as a implications and we are proposing multimodal uh, you know multi you know using you know targeting multiple biomarkers using multiple techniques to generate that kind of you know that kind of fingerprint which can easily different you know distinguish from you know ad patients from healthy uh, individuals of course some of the inventions which i mentioned here are now taking it forward for developing a point of care uh, diagnostic kit for alzheimer disease through our startup company that is uh, vini uh, biotechnologies private limited of course i am not sure you know flashing this because we have started a you know uh, company because you know that is not the uh, intention i would like to mention particularly to student that you know things have changed and you know government of india Uh, is encouraging encouraging to to take it take take forward our uh, basic science uh, discoveries uh, you know to become a products and precisely that's what we are trying to do uh, uh, in case of alzheimer disease
coming to ad treatment uh, are a therapeutic uh, therapeutics are a therapeutic modalities well these are some of the drug candidates you must have some of you must have heard that these are the drugs available in the market for alzheimer disease in fact i i don't want to call them drugs for alzheimer disease because they are not true drugs they do not target uh, the directly they do not directly target the underlying mechanisms of alzheimer disease uh, and they can give only temporary relief, relief by modulating the brain chemicals okay if there is a time you can talk about that later on in, in the discussion time so they can only give temporary relief to patient particularly especially uh, you know in 50% of the patient and that to possibly for 6 to 12 months okay and more importantly so they are extremely toxic okay they are extremely toxic and all i would like to say that definitely there are no fully approved drugs uh, targeting core pathology of alzheimer disease however a an important you know good news came uh, you know in a first good first of such good news came a couple of months ago Uh, precisely last year july a drug candidate based on an antibody based drug candidate uh, is called adpunab or its trade name adulam was uh, has received a conditional approval by fda which was developed by uh, biogen well this was definitely good good news for the community uh, uh, you know and our patients as well as the researchers who work in the area but it was also hugely controversial okay so please remember that it is you know given conditional approval and the full efficacy is yet to be uh, uh, you know uh, proved and more importantly it's very expensive okay it's quite expensive so nevertheless i am not going to negative aspect of it but definitely this is one of the first drug uh, uh, to be approved wherein this antibody can actually clear these protein aggregates from from the brain but that is again you know supposed to be uh, in the mild to moderate disease conditions definitely there are no drugs for advanced stages uh, as well uh, as well so we uh, started some years ago working in this uh, aspects for example so this is the the amyloid beta peptide which i talked about earlier and this is the core motif from amino acids from 14 to 23 and that is responsible for that protein aggregation through beta sheet and other non covalent interactions so researchers several research group try to use this peptide or a fragments of this peptide uh, you know because it can recognize this core as a inhibitors unfortunately that didn't succeed you know go well mainly because for two reasons one is these peptides are you know not stable you know against proteases and secondly the affinity was not good enough Uh, to be a truly good inhibitors to overcome these problems what we did was we inserted this cyclic uh, dipeptide unit we designed this unnatural amino acid uh, here and then we inserted again there is very interesting work i don't have time to go into the detail except to say that the incorporation at the you know three you know n terminal c terminal and also at the middle was found to be very effective uh, uh, inhibitor and of course we also we are, there were two uh, important aspects we were looking at what is to understand the disease uh, conditions and secondly can we inhibit this protein aggregation and here is the data you see this this is the a beta aggregates you can see that the a beta aggregates and you also see some of the oligomers you know embedded uh, in them and these aggregates uh, uh, will actually interact these are the cell data these aggregates will interact you know you can see that red stain what you see that is aggregates they are interacting with the membrane so subsequently they may you know they interact with the membrane and cause toxicity and uh, in presence of our inhibitor you can see that that inhibits this protein aggregation and thereby it protects you know protect the cells and of course because there is specific amino acids uh, that also prevents a ros uh, generation particularly in presence of uh, uh, biometals such as copper and it has you know additional uh, advantage well th- that is not something which we are looking forward we wanted to understand how it feels like you know how it really looks like you know uh, you know the how the cells actually look like uh, under these uh, agri- you know conditions for that we use this very specific uh, you know very uh, advanced you know machine sorry uh, technique that is for speak quantitative nano mechanics uh, afm as i earlier uh, mentioned uh, which is uh, a part of bio uh, afm uh, equipment and here in we can actually measure some of the cellular mechanics data and from that we can actually draw inference what happens in the absence presence and also uh, of uh, a beta aggregates and how these 
electrode, the, the inhibitor which I mentioned can possibly uh, affect uh, this, uh, possibly affect, uh, protect the, the cells. See on the top right corner, uh, left corner, you can see that is the healthy cells, healthy neuronal cells. And when we incubate this with a protein aggregate, you know, the protein in a A beta, it's undergo aggregation and interact with the cells. And you can see that cells starting, start forming these stress fibers and also becoming flattening. And that can be clearly seen here. The height profile can be measured by this, you know, quantitative nanomechanics AFM. So the healthy cells uh, usually, you know, show and exhibit a height, height profile of around, you know, I mean, usually thickness. Uh, size of the cell around you know, 5, 5.5 micron. And upon interaction with A beta, so that the thickness reduces, meaning the cells is becoming flattening here, you know, it drastically similar in the stiffness. If you measure the stiffness of these cells, and you can clearly see that the LC cells show the stiffness of around uh, 20 to 30 kilopascal, but upon interaction with A beta 42, that, uh, you, know, you know, because of flattening of the cells, you know, leads to, you know, higher stiffness of 400 kilopascal. It's a huge uh, change. But in presence, you know, if you, you know, kind of treat these cells, you know, with uh, such a, you know, cells under toxicity with our uh, peptide, and you can see that that reverses both in terms of height as well as, uh, you know, in terms of stiffness. This is something very unique data, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, you know, well, you know, came out first time that, you know, indeed the cell, the interaction of A beta, uh, induce you know huge changes in their cellular uh, mechanics. Well, this is uh, maybe I skip this. At this time, at some point, you know, although we started 10, 12 years ago, at some point, you know, we started target. We also started targeting individual pathways. I'm not showing all the data, but at some point, we realized that you know Alzheimer is actually a you know complex disease, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So this is uh, the the information I gave you is not that something I we gathered in the beginning itself, but our uh, understanding, you know, kind of, you know, came about, you know, you know, you know, for after several uh, years of work in this area. So we wanted to develop molecules, uh, you know, you know, kind of a candidates which can tackle such a multifaceted toxicity. And in the process, we come across this GHK, a tripeptide. It's called GHK. Okay, and this is uh, found, in, you know, you know, it's a natural peptide which is found in our body, a human body. I, I sometimes I'm jokingly say that it's a natural product uh, from humans and all of us have it. And uh, so this is, you know, it does so many functions. Okay, it does so many functions. Even I don't, sometimes I call it Sanjeevini. Okay, so again, I'm not going to the details except to say that indeed you say it's a extraordinary, you know, uh, peptide. It does so many functions by complexing with copper. Okay, so in the adult, uh, adults have, a, you know, somewhere around, you know, 200 nanogram per, uh, you, know, you know, ml uh, fluid, body fluid. And as we age, the concentrations also goes down to below 80 nanogram. And what is more interesting is that it's KD values for, you know, copper binding. Okay, this copper binding KD values are such that it can easily take up the copper from A beta complex. If you remember, I showed you, you know, copper complexes become a machines, okay? So here, this peptide can sequestrate that copper and keep that copper in a redox dormant state, meaning, you know, stopping that redox process, we can stop reactive oxygen species, while, it, you know, it does, you know, it will, you know, it will not affect the enzymes, copper-based enzymes at all. Okay, so considering these parameters, we designed this multifunctional peptide, you know, peptide, so that is GHK, and this is a hybrid peptide which we developed uh, in our earlier work. I'm not presenting, which can modulate the protein aggregation, meaning it can inhibit protein aggregation. Together, in fact, it's found to be a multifunctional inhibitor that was very encouraging for us. However, there were two drawbacks, meaning these P6 can be multifunctional. You know, it does uh, you know work as a multifunctional inhibitor uh, at the concentrations more than 100 micromolar. And secondly, it because you know it serves as a multifunctional inhibitor only in presence of copper two. Okay, but if you remember, I talked, you know, I mentioned the reactive oxygen species can be produced also in presence of iron, and independent of these metals, also reactive oxygen species are produced. So to overcome, you know, to make this GHK a truly a multifunctional molecule, you know, we are you know being organic chemistry group, so we did a minor uh, modifications. Uh, to derive at these, you know, four molecules, and these molecules were found to uh, complex copper and iron both, 
uh, both and particularly i am not showing you know many i'm skipping a lot of data uh, here in vitro uh, data and also in cellular data and this particular molecule compound 4 4 was found to be a real multifunctional molecule it modulates reactive oxygen species modulates aggregation and more importantly uh, it also serves as a neuroinflammation you know particularly protecting you know in the, you know in the in presence of glial glial cell that is something another uh, equally important uh, topic so having uh, having you know kind of tested so many you know the multifunctionality of this molecule we wanted to really see whether you know it is a truly you know antioxidant or anti inflammatory compound and uh, we wanted to test that in this nrf2 pathway so nrf2 is a, a transcription factor we find mostly in the cells and when these cells are subjected to oxidative stress and nrf2 translocate itself uh, from cytoplasm to nucleus and wherein it binds to antioxidant responsive element uh, you know particularly gene responsible for you know gene uh, as the information for oxidative and you know anti inflammatory uh, you know uh, proteins so thereby the uh, thereby cell actually protects uh, itself so we wanted to test our compound in this pathway and what you see here in the top you see that the green stain what you see is the uh, is a uh, 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 nrf2 you can see mostly you know nrf2 in the cytoplasm of course you also see some in the you know nucleus uh, nucleus but nevertheless when the cells are subjected to reactive oxygen species uh, you can see that all of all of the nrf2 is translocated to nucleus and if you do the same thing in presence of our compound lead compound 4 and you can see that you can see the cells very similar to the healthy cells without uh, not under oxidative uh, you know external oxidative uh, stress you can see nrf2 is also uh, in the nucleus meaning our compound is actually doing the job what nrf2 was doing but not you know kind of a, not, not uh, you know directly but it is taking care of anti oxidative stress and uh, inflammations so in a way so data which i presented and also data which i have not presented here all together this particular compound ghk analog 4 was found to be a, indeed a multifunctional uh, 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 inhibitor of course we also you know work on you know we we you know is alzheimer's is a very complicated disease probably one type you know strategy may not work that's why we work on many strategies we work on small molecules you work on natural products you also work on you know uh, hybrid uh, molecules and so on and so forth here we have come across with you know we came up with an, a new strategy that is hybrid multifunctional inhibitor this particular uh, molecules uh, uh, is called you know metal you know is called pioquinol this is one of the earliest drug this and analogs of these molecules are one of the earliest uh, molecules which entered clinical trail for alzheimer disease uh, However, it was you know those molecules were failed because of the toxicity. Otherwise, this is EGCG, a natural polyphenolic compound which is there in our green tea, and people are trying, you know you know taking this you know studying this, and also I believe you know some are also taking this for clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. However, I believe this is not definitely this is non-toxic. But I believe this is more of a neutrocytical, okay? Uh, uh, meaning, for example, if you drink green tea for your lifetime, definitely you will have a good effect. But it cannot be drug. Drug has to, you know, function in a day, week time, or a you know month, or at least one or two years. You know, you cannot wait for a you know in a lifetime uh, for a disease, you know, drug to work. So in that context, so this is a good drug, but it is toxic, and this is non-toxic, but it is not a good drug. So what we did was we decided to integrate structure and functional uh, components of these two and came up with a hybrid multifunctional uh, molecule uh, essentially to make them less you know non toxic to cells and but still you know retaining that you know the activity so precisely one of the you know compound tgr86 was found to be uh, the that you know non toxic relatively non toxic molecule and this was also indeed uh, you know served as a multifunctional uh, molecules uh, as i shown here and uh, so on the same concept taking you know forward similar concept we work on you know kind of as you know we identified a natural uh, product is called berberine which is used in chinese medicine and also used in india for you know uh, dyeing and a few other uh, industries material it looks uh, very similar to uh, curcumin 
and also we just like curcumin this berberine you know isoquinoline based natural product is also extensively studied for many diseases but there are uh, you know the molecule itself uh, is toxic you know it becomes it causes uh, my, you know, mitochondrial fragmentation and also there is a solubility issues to overcome that we modified the structure of that uh, natural products that is a berberine derived compound here i show here and this was found to protect uh, you know uh, mitochondria and also found to protect uh, protect cells from neurodegeneration as we assess by quantifying the levels of caspase and uh, cytochrome c which are apoptosis marker you can see that under uh, amyloid uh, disease and you know, amyloid uh, uh, toxicity see i levels of caspase but upon treating these those cells with berd you can see that the levels of caspase and <coughs> cytochrome c have been brought back to reasonably you know normal conditions so in a way it protect mitochondria and also protect cells from uh, apoptosis and otherwise you can call you know nr degeneration of course this is another work we did with a collaboration with uh, professor rila rila uh, we a small uh, library of uh, thiopine based compounds we uh, screened and identified these particular four compounds as, as uh, modulators of both a beta aggregation and also uh, tau aggregation all i would like to say is one of the compound particularly the compound a8 was found to be the lead candidate uh, which protect which protect cells from both amyloid toxicity as well as tau based aggregation uh, associated uh, toxicity let's skip this and maybe i'll take one or two minutes uh, before i conclude so far i showed you some of our you know understand you know understanding of the disease mechanisms as well as you know kind of developing drug uh, uh, you know candidates possible drug candidates for alzheimer disease mostly based on the natural products or a peptides or a derived you know from you know known drugs but now i'm going to show you one example wherein we wherein we discovered an anti ad com you know candidate purely by design so we have designed a set of naphthalene monoimide based compounds and our in vitro and in cellular studies have identified tgr63 as a lead compound which not only inhibits protein aggregation but it can also dissolve protein aggregates for example if somebody has a alzheimer disease there is already protein plaques you know accumulated in the brain so it's not just about inhibition and we need to have a candidate which can dissolve that protein aggregates precisely that's what we required and in fact this particular compound uh, in vitro uh, and in cellular data show that it can both inhibit as well as dissolve these protein aggregates and thereby protect cells from such amyloid toxicity of course i'm not showing all the data here we encouraged by these data we wanted to uh we wanted to uh, uh to to test the efficacy of this compound in a reasonably true uh, alzheimer uh, model alzheimer uh, you know model particularly mice model by then we already have this as i mentioned earlier we have this established uh, double transgenic uh, mice model uh, let me tell you working with uh, this alzheimer mice model this is like a kind of a true model is very very uh, difficult okay so it's not like any other model like cancer or any other disease very very difficult to work with this model but nevertheless you know thanks to you know our students you know have taken up this challenge and uh, indeed we have established this mice model and what you see here the first panel is a healthy mice wild type meaning that is healthy mice you can see hardly you can see any you know protein aggregates and the central one you see the ad that is the panel that is the ad brain and you can see loads of amyloid aggregates really you know what the red stain what you see all of it is protein aggregates you know so much of amyloid burden and when these mice were treated with our drug candidate tgr63 you can clearly a significant reduction in the amyloid burden okay significant reduction that possibly you can see from this uh, zoomed in image this is the you know area small area you know zoomed in area from a cortex and hippocampus and this on, on upon treatment with the drug candidate there is a 70 to 80% reduction in amyloid burden this is you know kind of a very very encouraging for us however please as i remember i told you like the antibody drug candidate uh, case the antibody also reduces amyloid burden but that cognitive uh, uh, gain uh, is still very doubtful that's why i told you that is not fully approved so the amyloid burden reduction in amyloid burden itself is not good enough 
but that has to be translated uh, into uh, into recovery of cognitive or improvement in cognitive functions that can be done by several uh, behavioral tests as you know the neuroscientists which uh, they uh, you know use uh, regularly in fact we also did extensive uh, behavioral uh, tests in fact we did three different uh, behavioral tests called an open field test novel object identification test and more is water mastered they are very extensive uh, data so i will not go into the data except that i will show you a video uh, hopefully that will you know seeing is believing you can see the efficacy of the drug candidate so this is a 30 second video uh, can you see the video hello uh, uh, can you yes. see the video yeah yes okay yes. so here this is called morris water maze test what we do here is that you know so we, this is we take a water tank here this water tank can be divided into for example four quadrant and in one of the quadrant we place a hidden platform and then we leave both lt and uh, you know well type that is lt and uh, ad uh, ad uh, ad mice which are uh, treated or untreated okay conditions and to check whether you know what is the learning and memory you know how they you know actually do in terms of learning and memory for example when we train uh, them you know if you leave a mice here you know any of the quadrant they you know swim around and you can they also get tired and they will try to find a platform to rest and you know and they were you know if they are good in learning they can come and find this platform and later on and if there is a problem and you will see the deficiency and later we remove this uh, platform and see whether they do you know memory you know they do have a memory of the place where this you know the platform was placed okay let us see what happens yeah you see this you know the, there is a platform here and these are the lt mice of course one is treated another one is not treated and here are the ad mice and you see the wild you know wild type mice is lt is already you know found the platform and wild type mice treated with the drug also found the platform meaning there is no side effects and here is the ad mice uh here you see the ad mice treated with the drug candidate could also find the platform but the one which is not treated you know ad mice which is not treated absolutely has no clue okay this is the data i will not go into that so next what we do we remove that platform and see please uh, you know take a look you know how many times that mice you know comes to this quadrant where the 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 the, the platform was kept more number of time they come that means their memory is good okay they remember the platform you see that wild type mice and the ad treated mice they remember they come to that plot, you know region several times but the one the one which has uh, not treated absolutely has no clue so that means there is a you know memory deficit okay uh, yeah i hope uh, the video from the video i think you can make out that the significant reduction in this amyloid burden also uh, translated into exceptional translated into exceptional recovery or a uh, you know you know kind of improvement uh, in the uh, in the in the memory you know in the memory uh, functions uh, to conclude i kind of you know uh, started with dementia and i told you how alzheimer disease contribute you know is a major contributor to dementia and i also show you know kind of uh, hope i was convinced you know i was able to convince you uh, the alzheimer is a multifactorial or a complex disease there are multiple biomarkers and targets and i also quickly of course i'll not going i didn't go into the detail but i did show that we have developed a differential detection and validation of novel biomarkers and multi pronged approach we believe is anticipated to deliver both diagnostic and therapeutics finally i showed you a drug candidate uh, which is identified you know for alzheimer disease and here i would like to mention that you know this work particularly the last drug candidate which i showed you is almost started almost 11 years ago and uh, you know and uh, so far now we have showed the efficacy in the in the mice model if you take a drug discovery uh, this is particularly for the student it takes anywhere from 12 to 15 years that is the timeline for any drug to come into the market and also with the investment of you know billions of you know dollars 
and uh, ours is an organic chemistry lab you know we started some earlier and as i kind of showed you so we have reached uh, here animal model and of course going from animal to human model is you know kind of a very steep uh, process nevertheless that you know because of this efficacy the because of the molecule you know molecule the efficacy the molecule has shown if you know uh, you know several pharma companies have came forward of course we have chosen one pharma and we are almost in the final stage of licensing this molecule and this per pharma is uh, very much keen on taking it forward for clinical trials uh, hopefully uh, very soon so that is the uh, the kind of uh, recent uh, update so i would like to thank my uh, student of course as i showed you we work on many different areas and are functional and disease amyloids and the work which i presented today you know is especially uh, involves uh, raj shekar saurav who are actually uh, in europe and uh, us working on human brain project or even neurosurgery department and the current student you know madhu uh, is a veterinary student debashish ghosh and mauli mauli and thanks to all the collaborators and definitely all the funding agencies you know without which uh, it's not possible to do such kind of research thanks to professor siena rao uh, who is always uh, you know there you know, as a mentor and we always look up to him and uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention that is our lab in jnc asa that is the chemistry lab thank you very much for your kind attention i will be very happy to answer uh, if there are any queries and questions thank you uh thank you professor govind raju for a very interesting lecture uh, i'm sure my colleagues and the younger colleague students would have captured the most important point that the laboratory research should not stop at the publication should go to the next level of technology transfer and possible startup so there are few questions from the colleagues who were watching in youtube uh, sure. i shall read it out uh, the question from dr sangaja let me couple two of them Uh, early detection is the key to uh, alzheimer disease management how early an uh, ad pathology be diagnosed in human using the biomarkers is the first part of the question sure second part of the question is what makes these markers specially bind to amyloid do they bind to other molecules also okay so thank you uh, very much uh, for the question although i alluded to them but possibly because i am possibly too fast or i didn't give enough information data there so thank you for asking so that i can now explain the same uh, in terms of the how early as i told you usually uh, the age you know around 65 to 70 that is the age uh, you know kind of people uh, will be detected alzheimer disease of course that timeline is also coming down to 50 55 and that is mainly based on the behavioral symptoms meaning you already start seeing that you know the patient is losing himself he can't remember anything he can't learn he's no short term uh, there is a problem in short term memory okay things like that so that is a visible symptoms okay and that is a advanced stage once that happens it's like an advanced stage like a point of no return so if we have to do a early diagnostic that has to be at least uh, 10 to 20 years before so what we are doing is that you know for example this particular probe uh, uh, we have developed this is uh, also i think i am answering the other part as well uh, the second part of the question so i use the term uh, antibody selectivity and sensitivity so please believe me as i you know i'm only showing the uh, the success part of it uh, you know and all the failures and many things you know when we learn from failure but please remember that failures are very very important uh, in fact we designed the probes and they were research, you know quite selective for these protein aggregates but there was also off target uh, you know binding okay. and from there on you know we took clues and then we designed this particular uh, probe you know we evolved you know, structurally because that is uh, an advantage that we ourselves is in organic chemistry group and uh, we come up with a final molecule which binds selectively okay so i i can talk about and you can look into the publication you know there is a lot of information is given so it is very very selective uh, for this you know a beta so now taking this particular probe this is near infrared probe and uh, what we are trying to do in our company as i which the one i mentioned because lot everything can be done in the you know our laboratory okay students uh, you know come and they have five years time you know uh, within that they have to finish their phd and so on and then they also don't want to do something which is done by the other candidate okay so phd candidate and you know many things 
so anyway luckily this is patented and because of its uh, potential and wherein we are now developing uh, you know this as a near infrared probe unfortunately near infrared uh, technology itself is not available in the clinic yet so instead so for that we are also adding a small radio probe like you know f18 and so that we can do pet probe and this molecule cross the blood brain barrier and at least in the mice model so that just like the way the people uh, do this angiogram for for example you know somebody has a clot in the blood vessels and something like that so if there is some kind of doubt so they can just go for this kind of angiogram kind of thing and we can actually see that if there is a you know you know kind of a, you know flux accumulation of flux in the brain and that subsequently because the molecule is not toxic at least in the animal model there is a lot of work to be done but we are determined to do all that so but as of whatever we have it is non toxic and this can be you know administered and followed uh, of uh, the pathology alzheimer pathology and this can be done much earlier yeah and there are few other ideas as well so i will not i mean yeah but not necessary for me to discuss here i think i answered both the questions yeah thank you professor uh, he has uh, two more questions continuation to it sure do pgr6 beta cross the blood brain barrier did you find pgr6 in brain tissues and the second part of the question is tgr63 may also influence pathology of ad by interacting with peripheral systems can you please comment on that okay thank you i mean first all the three simple answer is yes okay because this we have done it in the you know the i say intraperitoneal administration and it does go to brain we have done all the analysis and we also done toxicology studies in the you know all the different organs okay in the mice so it is not toxic in fact there is i mean it is you know we are still you know you have to prove a lot of things but uh, it improves memory even in the healthy mice okay there is some you know very very interesting data uh, which we are not present you know uh, data you know uh, we have observed ourselves okay uh, it improves the you know the memory not only in the ad it also there is some level of improvement in the alzheimer so there is also something very important thing you know we are uh, you know we have observed that is a real which we have to kind of identify you know how it is doing so that way it is yes so it crosses blood brain barrier in the animal model so far everything is uh, fine and uh, for the last question uh, to be frank i'm sorry about it but i didn't understand uh, it uh, properly it goes to peripheral or something like i don't know what shall i repeat the question uh, yeah no no you, you, what you read it's you know i i heard okay but the question itself is not clearly what uh, the, uh, the is uh, you, you know he wants to know from me okay. uh, probably dr ja can write to you or yes yes you yes yeah, yeah yeah right so he is very keen about it so he will probably write to sure, you sure sure yeah yeah uh, there there are a couple of you can ask me as well now if we can reframe it uh, possibly that's also fine ah uh, he is actually watching in youtube so yeah 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 uh, there are a couple of questions from the students so let me post that um is pathology behind the mci type ad is due to monomer formulation or something else that's the first part of the question mm -hmm. uh, this it's not really the second part the other question is uh, for the in vivo models how can we differentiate that the animal is in mci stage or in the pathology stage okay uh, yeah so thank you uh, i think uh, possibly the student is asking uh what see i i use the word polymorphic species okay so i i use for a specific reason uh, uh because i do know i cannot explain everything but i use the polymorphic species where we have a monomer monomer aggregates you know assemble to form a oligomer and oligomer goes to photofibrils and photofibrils to fully grown aggregates and uh, in recent time you know data i mean studies uh, from across the you know globe several studies shows that oligomers are more toxic Uh, than the aggregates okay so but believe me the aggregates are also toxic because there is something else is there but oligomers are more toxic because they can actually interact see that's what i was mentioning about membrane so these species interact with the membrane and they can form a pinch you know they can pinch hole into the membrane and then cause a you know kind of a artificial ion channels and that leads to excessive influx of calcium and then subsequently it leads to neuronal cell death 
okay so meaning so the oligomers are considered you know more toxic in other words the you know, fully grown aggregates are also toxic and uh, all i would like to say is we when we do studies we take care of you know we study the different species all these three species but not the monomer monomer itself is not toxic but tell me uh, let me tell you who we were uh, you know asking the monomer is produced of course with a reason there is a physiological importance okay everybody when they talk about protein aggregates they talk about straight away toxicity that's not the case so the these um, you know, monomers they produced in the brain with a purpose okay so because they have many other you know things i am not going to the data it takes time but they are good you know i mean they are required and that's why they are produced but just like the ros i said you know i mean it is like a cause or effect it's still you know you know kind of controversial but at some point somehow the system you know kind of drives uh, towards more production and their collapse of, you know like a misfolding and aggregation so that's where the problem starts thank you professor uh, uh, yeah those were the questions posted in the youtube i if if i can be asked sure sure go ahead go ahead i have a small question uh, i am a non biologist so this question might sound very very fundamental uh, in one of my talk was targeted to both uh, you know uh, i mean general biology and cell also no problem so in one of your slides you mentioned about the hcl is been produced which is actually killing the microorganisms through the mm -hmm. free radical uh, so that is linked to the the immunity so i'm just connecting the dots i mean is it fair to say that higher the immunity uh, the chances for the person to get the ad is higher is that the direct relation no okay okay so <laughs> thank you uh, if i was not uh, clear enough uh, my apology but let me explain now thank you that you know uh, that you have asked this question uh, see this hocl is produced in neutrophils i mean in a common term we know red blood cell white blood cells and these white blood cells are the ones which kill bacteria right that's what we heard so hocl is produced in uh, the blood you know these white blood cells okay and also something called phagosomes and that happens uh, you know its production happens uh, when and the, our you know immune system identifies that there is some invasion by a, you know uh, the bacteria or uh, some pathogens like it can be a bacteria or a virus and uh, hocl is produced and the hocl and then these white blood cell they go on you know tracking this right uh, these pathogens and then these H and during that condition so the hocl actually produced and then it basically chew up you know it's a oxidizing agent hocl so it actually basically you know it kind of destroys the pathogen but uh, and that is and uh, you know you know fully controlled you know it's not like you know it's produced you know you know over produced or under produced not like that it produced as much as required you know depending on the pathogens or something for example if the virus load is too high too high and that's where you know it happened you know for example in case of corona virus you must have heard of course there is also other reasons the inflammation itself you know become a problem you know you remember so, you know inflammation you know comes and uh, as an immunity you know too much of you know high uh, immunity or immune response while the immune response is good to come you know kind of combat these diseases but high immune response itself started acting you know kind of a, like autoimmune kind of thing started killing our own healthy cells so precisely that's what happened here so there is a threshold concentration it's called uh, in a biological term we call it as homeostasis homeostasis means you know it can be applied to anything so there are certain for example you know whether it's a metal ions or a reactive oxygen species sometimes some of the proteins they have to produce and consumed produced consumes and the level will be you know the some you know the basal level will be maintained so if it is not maintained if it is under produced then there is a problem if it is over produced there is also a problem so that's what i was referring to uh, and uh, what happened in case of alzheimer condition in the brain there is one enzyme that myeloperoxidase
Uh, yeah, uh, we lost you for a moment. <laughs> Some uh, 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 disruption here. Yeah. Sorry about. Okay. Yeah. I hope I, I, I so this myeloperoxidase converts continuously converts hydrogen peroxide into HCl, which is uh, not necessarily you know kind of required. and that leads to you know excessive oxidation stress and inflammation and the biomolecules will be you know like for example lipid will be oxidized dna will be oxidized protein will be oxidized it's like a kind of a you know the term we use corrosive you know it really become corrosive uh, thank you professor once again i would like to thank on behalf of sastra uh, for the wonderful lecture and on my behalf i would like to congratulate you for winning sastra cnr award thank you so much thank you thank you shastra so thank you very much hope to look forward to visiting shastra sometime later i already came some time ago and i gave a talk a general talk public talk uh, for a student on a, you know periodic table international year of periodic table okay. yeah 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 so i was there uh, that i gave a talk on a more of a, uh, for a school children so yeah thank yeah, you thank you all yeah yeah we'll be happy to host you <laughs> sure